Okay, everyone, welcome, welcome. We are going to learn. I didn't give the shear last night. I went to a bris late, and it was far, pretty far in Oxnard, and the time I got back was me after 9 o'clock. I hadn't gotten the chance because of that trip to do any preparation. So the shear from last night, Thursday night class, is happening Friday morning. Baruch Hashem, we have some really good, good, good goodies today. <clears throat> I'm very excited. Baruch HaTadi, So fasten your seatbelt because we're in for a ride. All right. I, I know I'm holding in the middle of the class for the uh, four priestly garments. And sadly, <clears throat> last time I gave that class, um, I had the camera, whatever, that I couldn't see, that the camera suddenly disconnected. Um, the YouTube, whatever, the connections disconnected. And I was a three, it was a three-hour class, but I was only connected for about an hour and 45 minutes. So the last hour and 15 minutes didn't catch. In addition to that, we still need to do a whole, even if after that hour and a quarter is completed, there's still at least another two hours on that subject. I'm going to leave that Bezrat Hashem for another time. We're going to hopefully complete that. Right now, I'd like to learn something related more to the parsha. Um, although the book Lakuti Torah, this phenomenal, incredible book of the Alter Rebbe's Memorium on the parsha, on the latter three books, Vayikra Bamidbar and Devarim, they are. Um, um, we we I I thank Hashem, thank God we finished already all the discourses on Parshas Naso, even though there's quite a bit. Uh, but on Parshas Bamidbar, which was last week's Torah portion, we did not finish all. There's still quite a few left, and I'd like to learn one on those because the subject matter, although it's a pasuk in Parshas Bamidbar, fits for Parshas Naso as well, and for the time of the giving of the Torah, which the Shabbos culminates the giving of the Torah, as we always know, the Shabbos. Um, after any, every Shabbos elevates the week. So since Sunday was the day of the giving of the Torah, which was Sunday and Monday, the Shabbos elevates the week. This mimer, this discourse was said by the Alter Rebbe, uh, on Pashat Bamidbar, relating to the giving of the Torah, because the dynamics of Pashat Bamidbar is connecting to the Torah. And um, now, so here's the deal. Every, uh, we discussed many times, the discourses of the Alter Rebbe came in, in, in most of the times in two, in two phases. First, he gave over the pure Hasidus, which we might call the pure divine divinity of the Mimer, the pure inner light of the Mimer. And then the Alter Rebbe would give more the, the background, the underlying Kabbalistic internal wiring, which builds building blocks from back end uh, of what constructed this thought and this idea. Um, so usually the discourses themselves, the Hasidic discourse on its own is easier, and the explanations are a little more complicated because it uses much more Kabbalistic terminology. And if we might say something like this, if the discourse is, is explaining the verse and cracking open the verse of the Torah, and giving us the godly light that's in it, enabling us to experience the not not a, not a story about Jews traveling in a desert a long time ago, but how this is applicable and alive today, vibrant in our lives. And what does this mean? Um, the the so that's the the mimer itself is the is the godliness of the oh as it is applicable, to, you know, in our own small world. The, the the explanation on the discourse is usually talking far more cosmic, meaning it's explaining the the concepts as they are in the spiritual spheres and the upper realms above. How does that work? Because the human being is a small little microcosm of the macro. So in the discourse, he focuses more on the mac on the micro, and in the explanation, he's explaining it more on the on the grandeur scale. Um, so for all those reasons, the discourses, are, the, the explanations of the discourses are usually harder to learn. This time, I would say that Baruch Hashem, the explanation of, and the discourse itself, we studied a few years ago. 
Um, I don't remember which year, but we learned it. Um, this is the explanation on the discourse. So, but the good part is that this time it's not as, you know, mystical. It's not as difficult. It is mystical, but it's not as difficult to understand. It's pretty, it's far easier for us to be able to follow. I must. So, um, here we are. This mimer actually needs, Rabbi, um, uh, this mimer needs Moshe Storch in the background just to give the niggin behind the mimer. So even if he's not uh, singing, just the mere presence of him being over here. All right, I guess I'm coming in. Now. <laughs> What's the niggin? The niggin is, is, is whatever is coming from the neshama. This is... <laughs> The Mimer discusses the quest. I call the Mimer the romance of heaven and earth. So the Mimer talks about the 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 two parts, Midbar Sinai and Oyal Moye. Midbar Sinai is the the cosmic yearning for the relationship, for the light to come down, or on a personal level, the davening where the Jew is thirsting and longing to, to godliness. And oil mayed is the divine response to illuminate the soul with that, with that godly light. So it's a very powerful mimer. And it has a lot to do with some, uh, with thirsting and yearning and longing and praying. And yeah, so that's it. All right, so we're ready to start. So he came in just at the right time. Give give us the right notes. Anyways, here we are. Bahavan be manal. So to understand the explanation on the idea, the Indian, this is on page on Lakuti Torah, on page Gimel, Daf Gimel, and it's Amud the Bays. Amud Bays is different than in Gemara. Gemara Amud Bays means the second side. Over here, there are four columns to each page. So Amud Bays means the second column on the first side of the page. Okay. So let me just say briefly. Um, what the Alter Rebbe said in the initial discourse, and now he's coming to explain it in this Maimon. So as mentioned earlier, in the initial discourse, he's speaking usually more on a personal level, and in the explanation of the discourse, he's usually talking more on a cosmic level. And the verse is talking about that Moshe was instructed by Hashem to count the Jewish people, him together with Aaron, his brother. They also took the the Nesim, the princes of each tribe, and they had to oversee the census, the counting of the Jewish people. So we understand that simply as a counting, to count. But the, the Torah uses a very interesting term. So, U.S. Rosh B'nai Yisrael, lift up the heads. But there must be a deep secret over here. That Moshe and Aaron, by counting the Jewish people, weren't just counting them, but he was actually lifting their souls up to something very deep and very powerful. <clears throat> it was elevating them... <clears throat> to the level of their souls prior to the descent in the body. Our souls are so powerful and so great when they're up there. They come down in the body, <clears throat> they're hindered and they're obscured, they're a little blocked, sometimes a lot blocked. And our spiritual juices, our spiritual light is not, is not uh, so accessible. So you need motion iron to restore our souls to its pristine state. And then we can, and, 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 and so the verse says, raise their heads, what well, the verse says, raise them to the the uh, 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 Simply means count them to their families, which means don't just count people. Know how much is in each family. Lebeis uh, avoysam to their father's house, which means to which tribe they come from. But then it says legilgalaysam to their skulls, which means each person should be counted. But if you read the verse from the inner godly level. So what you're reading is Moshe and Aaron, these two powerful, super, super powers of divine channel, of divine assistance. And they're meant to pick us up. First, the Mishpachaisim to our families is that we can connect to our souls when they were still on a higher level. Lebei Savoysim to their father's home means even higher. And the Gilgaloysim is hitting the highest peaks of the soul's connection to God. And these two things have to happen. The Torah also gives you where this took place. It took place in the, in the desert of Sinai 
Ba'ol Moed after we constructed the Ba'ol Moed, the tent of meeting. This count, the census took place on the second year. See, the Jewish people went left Egypt, 2448. So in 2449, they received the Torah three months later in 2448. In 2449 from creation, which starts Rosh Hashanah. Um, that whole year they spent at Sinai. They were build, busy building the, ta the, the tabernacle, but it wasn't constructed until the month of around April time of 2449, which is the month of Nisan. That's when they constructed the Mishkan. And that's called Oel Moe, the Tent of Meeting. Now, a month after they constructed on the anniversary, but the month, the first day of the second month, the month of Eor, like let's say, let's, say the, let's say the beginning of May, that's when they were told, that's when this count took place. So, but we understand that the dates and the times and the place have mystical content as well. So this verse is explaining to us the enormous meaning, primarily what we're going to delve into, is what does this mean in the place? The Torah describes the place where the, the, the count took place, that it was in the Sinai Desert, and it was at the Ol Moed at the Tent of Meeting. So in the Mimer, the Alter Rebbe explains as follows. Midbar, Sinai, Ol Moed are the two primary dynamics of our connection to God. Midbar Sinai represents a state of incredible yearning, a yearning that is unquenchable, and that's why it's called the desert. The desert is hot and thirsty. The Sinai desert, as it applies to the soul, means a thirsting, longing soul. But why is this, this, the soul so parched? And why is the soul so thirsty? Because it's parched because it's far, because it's distant. And this is the result, this is the tshuva moment, this is where we want to return. We want to, we realize how empty, how superficial, how, how distracted we are with such, with, 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 with such, with, with all the, with all the, all the, all the, all the, um, what you call it, fleeting elements of time and space. And how empty and hollow and meaningless they are. And when we, re when we remember who we are as a soul, and how foolishly attached and connected and obsessed we, we have become with things that are so fleeting and so temporary. And we, and we appreciate for a moment, we lift our eyes up from the muck and we remember the infinite and we get closer to the, and we meditate a little bit on the infinite and how disconnected we are from it because we're so selfish and so stuck in our own selves because that, which isn't really our true being. It's because of our body and our animalistic consciousness and so on and so forth. It creates a burning, a fire in the soul, and that's the fire of the desert. That's the Midbar Sinai. And that's pivotal because you cannot experience intimacy with God, a closeness with God, unless you're really, really, really open for it because that's all you want from the bottom of your soul with every fiber of your being. Your soul and your entire existence is on fire with this unquenchable thirst. Once you experience Midbar Sinai, the desert of Sinai, God responds to the desert of Sinai, of Midbar Sinai. And Hashem responds. No more, you can come in. Hashem responds to this unimaginable and un, 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 unquenchable thirst. Hashem responds to that by filling one's, your soul and your neshama with his infinite light and his infinite presence. And that's the divine response to our quest. And that's called the tent of meeting. So the tent of meeting is the descent of Hashem, Hashem's infinity into our soul, into our being. Um, the Midbar Sinai is our preparation. You know, Friday night we sing, let the, let, the, let the beloved go towards his bride. What does that mean? Who is, who is the beloved? The beloved is God. His bride represents each and every one of us. The souls are his bride. Or the Shekhinah, as we're going to see, is the bride. So there is a, there is a groom and a bride. The bride is called Kala because she's yearning, she's burning. Kala comes from the word in Hebrew, from the word Kilayon. It's like a flame that's expiring she's expiring with like with 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 un 
unlimited yearning. And then L'chadoy Yelikras Kala means that he's coming, he's coming to be with her. He's coming to, to extend himself to her and to embrace her and bring her into his, for her to become one with him. And that's through Torah and mitzvot. God flows, God's infinity flows into our soul. But we can do a mitzvah, we can give charity, we can do it and be oblivious to anything spiritual going on. And the whole service can be very mechanical and very dry. Or if we are really tuning into what's going on and we, we experience real prayer first, first we pray. And our prayer is not just lip service. Our prayer is the deepest burning of the soul to cleave to God. Then as a result of that powerful yearning, we can actually feel the light coming into us when, we're, when, we, are, when we are doing a mitzvah or studying the Torah. And these are the two pivotal elements of the Midbar Sinai Ba'olamoe. Midbar Sinai is the lifting up of both the individual person towards Hashem, our soul, and on a cosmic level, the soul of creation called the Shekhinah is yearning to return to her infinite source. That's all called the desert of Sinai. And then Oel Moed is already God's reciprocation and his descent from his infinite being to fill and, and, and to unify with his bride, which ultimately means with creation as it will be in the messianic time when God will be fully manifest within the world. In order for this to happen, there needs to be, um, in order for the Midbar Sinai Oel Moed to happen, we can bring ourselves we need our Moshe and Aaron. These are the two pivotal people. Because we know Moshe and Aaron facilitated the marriage between us and God. And the, and the reason you need facilitators of a marriage, it's just like by a, a, a groom and a, and a bride, when they're going to the chuppah, we, 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 we have the idea that they have an escort. Usually it's the parents. The parents escort their, chi- their children down to the, under to the canopy to the chuppah. So it's spiritually, it's understood that it's not just, you know, it's nice, it's honorable. Why do you need an escort? Let them go down. The escort is to help them, to elevate them, to, to lift them up, to bring them, because there's such a vast difference and between them that they need some assistance. And spiritually, when it comes to God and the Jewish and Israel, it's the same, and Jewish people, this is what it means, is that we need, we need assistance. Both the bride needs assistance and the groom needs assistance. We need assistance because, as we said earlier, we forget how spiritual we are. We forget that we're spiritual beings enclosed or godly beings enclosed in a physical corporal body. We think we are corporal. We think we are materialistic. We think that's our essence, but that's not true. So you need our own, the high priest, who is considered this, the escort of the bride, which means he awakens, he shines light and stimulates our spiritual, our spiritual juices. He, he awakens them. So that we're suddenly feeling love towards Hashem and we want to get close. He leads us into the experience of that burning desert. He brings us to the state of that unquenchable thirst. And so who's this Aaron? Aaron is a spiritual force in the, in the world that's there, that God created a channel. But he's also enclosed in the various great leaders of the Jewish people that help us experience our love to God. Which generally means like the tzaddikim, the great righteous leaders, the rebbe's and the so on and so forth, which awaken amongst their souls. They're super powerful. To have an encounter with them, we leave feeling very different. We're suddenly not interested so much in what we were interested in, the petty stuff of yesterday. Money and fame and, 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 and all these things stop being important. We start feeling suddenly a, a powerful excitement towards spirituality and holiness. That's the arrow. God also has an escort because God is so infinitely beyond. Why should he even, why should he even pay attention to our thirst and our longing? And why should he descend and compress himself into the world so that we can ju- join with him. But that God also has someone leading him. That's Moses. Moshe was the one who leads Hashem down onto the mountain. And that's also tzaddikim. There is different tzaddikim. And sometimes you can have one tzaddik, one, one, one great uh, Rebbe who facilitates both these roles as the, 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 the one who's, but these are two parts in him. One is to bring godliness down. And the other one is to elevate, the, elevate people upward. That's the dynamics of what he discusses in the Mimer, and now he's going to explain it 
in the in the role of the Shechina and Hakadosh Baruch Hu unify. Shechina represents the limited indwelling divine energy that's within creation. That's the mother of all souls. It's it's Hashem, but Hashem already as he almost like separates a piece of himself to become the soul of creation. So it's the godliness as it already confined itself to finitude. That's Shechina. Now Shechina is always deriving energy and receiving a, a constant flow from ha- HaKadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the uh, Kadosh means remove. Kadosh Baruch Hu is the masculine dimension of God, which is infinite and beyond and higher than creation. So Kadosh Baruch Hu is always feeding the Shekhinah. There's always a pipeline. There's always a tri- there's always a drip, because without the infinite light, then every then then the then then the creation becomes null, null and not. Shekhinah can't be sustained without Kadosh Baruch Hu. But usually it's just a a narrow flow from him to her. But then there's a concept called an intimacy. And intimacy is not just that it's like a husband and wife. There are times that he's supporting her. I mean, he go, you know, he's got the money and he he allowed, you know, gives her a checkbook, he gives her a credit card, she can use it, she can sustain the house, she can do what she's doing. That's one thing. But then in those moments, he's he, he's giving her a lot, but he's not giving her his, her his very self. But when they're engaged in a romantic moment, when they have, uh, you know, they're celebrating their honeymoon, or not the honeymoon, or they're celebrating, you know, their anniversary, or they're paying attention to each other, and and they're and, and they're leading up to an intimacy, and finally that they're having their intimacy. At that moment, they just the boundaries between him and her completely dissipate, and they become one entity. He and her become completely one, and that's the idea when the infinite descends and becomes one with the finite world, as the finite world rises up to receive the infinite, which means the Shekhinah rises up to receive God's entirely, as Hashem invests, it's much more than the general flowing energy that flows from him to her. Okay, so let's read inside. To understand the concept of this dynamic. In Midbar Sinai Oam Oed, it's all referring to the Malchus, the Shekhinah, it's also called the, the element. You know, there's ten sefirot through which God projects himself. And in the ten sefirot, the last of the ten sefirot is called Malchut, kingship. Malchus is, which is also referred to as Shekhinah. And Malchus of the, the four worlds, Atzilus, Bri, Yatsir, and Asiya. Atzilus is the highest world. A world that's still unified with Hashem. It's not yet creation. We live in the lowest of all worlds, in the world of Asiya. So Atzilus, in Atzilus, is that's where God's ten sefirot manifest. The nine upper sefirot are still considered infinite. Malchus, the, the final sefirot, she's already the source for a finite creation. It's called Malchus because kingship is where creation becomes important. Because, have, you know, the concept of being a king means you have a relationship with others. Because you can't be a king unless you have a you have a subject. If you have a, yeah, you have a community, you have a people, you have a nation, you have a country, and and those people can't be you. So that's what causes because God wants to be a king over his, over. Or that's why He brings forth creations that are not Him, or at least experience themselves independent and separated from Him. And yet, it, with those subjects, He wants to bond and connect to them. So that's called Malchus of Atzilus. So he's saying now that B'mid Bar Sinai and Ba'ol Moed, which is referenced in that first verse in, in the book of Numbers, that in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the desert of Sinai and, in the, and at the tent of meeting are both references to the Shekhinah, the Malchus of Atzilus. Why? Yeah, but there's a difference. Ki mid Bar Sinai, Mid Bar Sinai, in Allah's man. Mid Bar Sinai is, the, is, is a lower level. Because Midbar Sinai, the, the Sinai desert represents the Shekhinah when she's still in a state of separation. She's not yet unified with her husband. So she's still within the finite existence. But, she, however, she's not satisfied where she is. She's yearning for that intimacy. She's yearning to get out. Of, she knows, she feels claustrophobic. She feels, you know, so limited. And she wants to, to return back to unify with her source. It's almost like Eve wanting to go back and becoming a rib of Adam. 
you know, going back into her source, not existing, independent and separated. She wants to unify and become part of his body. And that powerful yearning, and, and, it's, and it is fulfilled, Eve uh, Chava becomes one with Adam when, in an intimacy, she's back, they become Lubasar Achad, they become one, one flesh over again. The difference is, instead of her becoming back a just a detail in his body, she, as she is a full-fledged being, still is now one with him completely. Where it's not like there's a seamless um, oneness go, f- with her and him, at least on, as long as they're together. And that seamless oneness is so powerful that it creates a child. Who's, and the child has is a combination of both father and mother. So this is the um, amazing idea of this unification of this togetherness. So he says Midbar Sinai is the Shekhinah before the intimacy, but she's yearning for the intimacy. And that's called Allah Asman. That's called she's raising her feminine waters. Raise, rising of feminine waters means that, a, that it's, it's the woman's quest for her husband and, she, and also that she's showing her husband that she wants intimacy. As if she's looking at him in a special longing way. That's called she's sending him a message. A, a woman is, is, is able to, to communicate to her husband. In Judaism, it's very important that this is that everything is done in a very modest, a very refined way. So it says, for example, halachically, that a woman should not state explicitly, you know, uh, you know, let's have intimacy. A woman is not supposed to do that. But she and but she is supposed to get dressed specially. She's supposed to, you know, give him a wink with her eye, give him a look, a romantic look. She's supposed to send, communicate powerful messages. And actually, that's much stronger than explicit talk, because that's really the that 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 that, that can fire him up much more than if she's blunt. Uh, it's all part of this 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 dance, this 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 very. Uh, we might call it um, uh, romantic dance. So with God, the, the yearning that we show, and it's in prayer, for instance, when our eyes are like giving Hashem a, a God is waiting for us to, to want him, to thirst for him, to long for him, and to give him, to give him a, 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 so to speak, a, 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 a longing look. And that's called raising of feminine waters, the malchus. She's rising from down upward. She's rising in a manner of feminine waters. Man stands for Maya Nuk from feminine waters. So that's Midbar Sinai. Oel Moed, on the other hand, the tent of meeting is also referring to Shechina. But Shechina, as she's already as she is already engaged in the actual intimacy. That because Oel Moed means the tent of meeting. It's where the meeting is taking place. It's their bedroom, so to speak. Their intimacy, where he and her, like we know that if you went into the Holy of Holies, what you see, the two cherubs representing one was male and one a female, and they were embracing each other. This was that, and this was this is what it stood for, this incredible moment or this incredible space, the space of that unity. Of oil moed, and the oil moed is the idea of the drawing forth of masculine waters. Shanim Shachmizairanpin. That's drawn from the sefirot that are higher than the Shekhinah, which is the masculine infinity of God. It's called the Zeir and small face, because on the one hand, it's still infinite. On the other hand, the very fact that Hashem is, has some image, at least of a husband, means that he has already personalized his non-personal, his beyond personal personality. He has already descended into some kind of a personality, albeit He's still infinite, infinite kindness, and all of his pers- personality traits expressed in the sphero, that's called Zairanpin, that's the male, that's the masculine. And when he will now unify with her, what happens? He calms her down. Well, he extinguishes her fire. What does he extinguish her fire? Because once she's together with him, she's now satisfied. Lahamtik, and that's what, in, in Kabbalistic terminology, that's referred to Lahamtik to sweeten Hamaya Nukfin, the feminine waters. Because the feminine mirrors are heat, heated. It's heat. It's powerful yearning. And to sweeten that means to calm it down. The gvura is the nukva. Her gvura, her powerful gvura is rising energy. Chesed, kindness, is, is, is descending energy, flowing from the giver to the receiver. The quest of the student to, to learn, to study from their teacher, that yearning is called gvura. It's an upward motion. 
it's an in yeah. um the nook for these gavura elements of of the female now he's showing us how this this dynamic exists between Hakadosh Baruch Hu and the Shekhinah, which means between the cosmic man and the cosmic female, they engage in this in this romance. But it also is individually experienced as each and every one of us can join this. And where is that in prayer? And he's going to show how in prayer there are the two phases. The 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 the, the latter part of prayer is actually an intimacy with God, because the moment Hashem appears. Davening is supposed to be a moment where God actually appears to you. And at a certain point of, of prayer, you when you become so ready for it because of your thirst and longing, then a person could merit that the divine opens up for them. And they actually start experiencing divine revelation into their soul, which means they experience the truth of God's existence. When that And where is that supposed to happen in prayer? He's explaining that from there's a blessing in, in the in the morning prayer. It's called Ahavat Olam. Ahavas Olam, Avtanu, the great love, eternal love, you have loved us. You have loved us. It's not us loving you. You have loved us. It's already the experience of the divine kiss. It's Hashem already embracing us. It's Hashem already illuminating our soul. And out of, and that actually is going to see soon. That part of the prayer is called Hechal Ava. It's called the chamber of love. And then when we say Shema Yisrael, Hashem al Hero Israel, God is one. It's not us describing something. It's us actually experiencing the ultimate truth that He is and there's none but Him. Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Achad. It's God appearing in your soul if we're Shemaing the way we're supposed to. And that continues throughout the entire prayer until after the Amida, until after Shmona Esra. Afterwards, we start descending back into the world into worldly consciousness. It's just that we're bringing that light with us, but already descending. But from the second blessing of the Shema, that's called the Havas Olam, eternal love, until after the Amida, that's a state of intimacy. Um, now, but the first part of the prayer the prayer from when we, you know, uh, beginning with the, the the morning blessings and all that, especially the songs, the verses of songs that we say Pesukah de Zimra, including the the first blessing of the Shema, is all to fan the flames of the female, which means of the soul. In other words, we're not yet experiencing the divine. We're still living in a worldly consciousness. We're still being blocked by the finitude of creation that's blocking us from experiencing the infinite. We're still seeing the world as something. And in that case, God has not yet opened the door for us. We're still knocking, we're standing outside and knocking at the door. But the way, but it first is by experiencing, that's, that's the upward motion of prayer. And from Shaman onward is more of a descent of God as he, as he, as he enters into our soul. And that's so the Mahava, so the Elah. Okay, we're saying you're not feeling this idea of prayer. Add the Havas Olam until we get to the, the blessing of, of eternal love, Shinikra Midbasvina, which is called Midbasinai. That's the first part. Havas Olam, the Elah, and then from Havas Olam and onward, Huam Shacha, that's the flow. That's when God is already flowing down. The Nikra Oil Moyed, and that's called the tenth of meeting. When she's barring it, Hashem, like will be explained. The Indian and the idea is as follows. In a it is known. So he's going to explain first why is our soul who is such a godly being? Why is why is our soul trapped in this darkness in the first in the first case? At first, I mean, if our souls are so holy and so godly, why couldn't they be locked in a loving embrace with the divine all the time? Why is it that most of our life we're not there? Most of our life we're 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 very much living in a non-godly awareness. What we notice around us and what we see and experience around us is just the world, the material world, and with all of its, with all of its stuff and sometimes pleasures and delights and stuff, which are very, very obviously to the to the to the spiritualist, to someone who really starts appreciates and knows the truth, they're utterly meaningless. But yet we get so caught up with these things to the point that they stop becoming so important. And we be, and we become so entangled in them, whether it's making a living and money and 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 other pursuits, 
which obviously take us away from our true yearning. So why is it that way? So the answer is God puts us into it so that we can yearn. Because if we're always connected, then we then it's not, you know, when do we really yearn when we're when we're removed? But there's another intention. Now, there's another reason why God put us into a body and God put us into a, and we know that in addition to the body, there's also an, a dark soul. Our godly inner light is enclosed first in a spiritual being, a spiritual soul, but it's a dark soul, which means a soul that doesn't know God, it knows the world and is excited about all the worldly stuff. They what's called an animal animal soul. It comes from the klipa, it comes from the unholy, it comes from the dark side. Why? Why is it that? And that translates later into what we call evil inclination and so on and so forth. So why is it that we have to be that way? And the answer is because there are sparks of holiness that have fallen in the in in the in the in a um, primordial collapse there has been sparks of holiness that have become like energies of god that have become disconnected from him of course that's all part of god's plan because he wanted to be to create the creation and have an inter entertainment in the building of the, the the bond between him and the world and the ultimate victory of goodness over unholy but in order to get to that place in order to create the the challenge, God separated from himself certain energies and had them fall. And these sparks of holiness have become integrated and assimilated into, into many, many, many dark aspects and to the other side, if we call it. And these are holy energies that need to be redeemed. The only way, go, way to redeem them is to enter into that space, live there, and we're going to see soon, initially be impressed and be actually... Um, uh, uh, um, get get um, distorted. That holy souls that are attached to God end up going into this dark place in which the forces of the Sitra Akhra, the other side, are persuasive and sometimes drag the soul into very, very dark stuff, which seems that that's a very, very poor investment from God's end, where he invested the souls into the, put the souls into these, into the dark places, because the souls are now becoming corrupted. But the purpose over here is that ultimately every soul wrestles itself free from its from the grip of the other side. Some people do it immediately when they're young and they right away start living a godly life, despite the fact that they have animalistic urges and lowly desires. And they immediately set the course right and pull themselves towards Hashem. But many people don't do that. Many people live 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, whatever it is, um, in the dark and, 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 and clueless and in a state of ignorance. But the day comes when there is a certain awakening and a certain clarity and a certain, and there is that moment. And then they do real teshuva. And when they're doing that, then they're extracting the sparks of, ho of, of holiness that have been embedded for thousands of years in the klipa and the unholy. And they return it to its holiness, to its Hashem. And that's the purpose of this descent. So just like we on our own individual the scent of our own soul into our body, into our animal soul, and living in our place in the world where we live, wherever you live, right? And th th there is that tikkun that you need to do. You need to elevate the sparks of the things that are around you. Um, the same is also on the cosmic soul, the Shekhinah. The Shekhinah also descends from being just focused on her husband, on the infinite light. She goes down and she actually becomes... Um, enclosed in the klipa, and that's the concept. For instance, when the when when Israel goes to exile, when the Jewish people go to exile, the Shekhinah comes along, and here this powerful, powerful divine, the, the power force of creation, the very energy of existence, becomes subjugated to forces of unholiness, and they torment her by doing what? This is spiritual forces of evil. They utilize her energy that she gives them to act in ways that is despicable in her eyes. They take her very energy and her vitality and her, because he's the one that she, calling her, it's, it's Hashem, but it's Hashem in that female form, so to speak, has now been abducted by these forces of darkness. And they're utilizing her energy for negative things, and that causes her enormous pain. But that's a temporary abuse. She's literally being abused by these various different forces. But eventually she gets the upper hand and not only does she extract everything they took from her, but she extracts it with a profit. 
She extracts even the top, the little bit of energy that was in them to begin with, those sparks of holiness that have been hidden there. To begin with, she ends up victorious, just like we said earlier, that if a person sins all their life, and yet in the end of their life they do tshuva, what happens is they, re they have now elevated everything. That means not only did they restore all their negative energies that they poured into negative activities, not only did they bring that back, but they brought it back with a surplus because the these little sparks that no one was able to get to is now been extracted because it got magnetically pulled in to holiness. It's a mystical idea which we discussed many times. So just like it is in the micro, in the in the micro, which is in each and every one of our lives, so it is in the shechina. That's what he's going to explain over here. The Indian idea is the you do it is known the Belaila that every night that night time is the time. Now we have day and night in, in creation in time. So just like I mentioned earlier, that um, the time of exile is a time when the Shekhinah gets gets like in, like dra drafted or or or, or um, abducted by the forces of darkness, and they take her in, and they and that manifests down here that Israel, the Jewish people, are now persecuted by the nations. Right, that's that's a reflection of it. But that but we weren't only in exile; we had a thousand years living in the land of Israel. Then we had a temple, and Jews were a superpower in the world, especially during the time of King David and, and King Solomon, Shlema Melech, David Melech. So during that time, what was that? So then the Shekhinah was not enslaved. Quite in the country, holiness dominated over the unholy. So these two periods, a period where holiness is in control, and a period where at least it looks like that the unholy is controlling the holy, these two periods are called night and day. Daytime is time of illumination, time when the, when, when the holy temple stood and there was great divine illumination in this world. And whatever was unholy was hiding in the, in the you know, were, were, were at least in a state of submission. They, they were hiding in their, in their, in their, in their, uh, in their little, uh, little holes. But then they, they came out. In time to the struggle because it becomes nighttime. So he's explaining that nighttime doesn't mean that the klipa on its own gets, you know, is able to overpower the, you know, so to speak, the shechina and, and go do whatever it wants. That doesn't happen. It's a divine game. It's God on purposely sets it up this way that he asks the shechina, which is an extension of himself, but the, to descend and make herself vulnerable and go down. So in Kabbalah, it says that this concept happens every 24 hours. Daytime is when the Shekhinah is not enslaved. She's in a state of complete receptiveness of her husband. Husband light flowing to her. The infinite is flowing her. She's illuminated. She's full of light. But then it says during the nighttime, she descends down into a dark place. And but when she does that, the the forces of darkness are able to attack her and hack her, so to speak, and take and take energy from her every night. But the purpose of her going down in the night is for the same idea that we spoke earlier, that a soul goes into a body, a soul goes into an animal, that it does an extraction, it elevates the sparks. And sometimes mentioned, that doesn't have to be that way, but sometimes in, until you get to that elevation, the first could be some... You have to take a few losses until you can make it the, the ultimate victory. That sometimes happens. So he explains over here. It is known that you do a belayla by night. You read the bebiya. The malchut element, the shechina, goes down into the three lower worlds. Biya means bria, yitzir, and asiya. Creation, formation, and asiya. Litin teref so to give teref, to feed her house. What does it mean she's feeding her house? The spark of holiness that she's going to extract is going to be nourishment to her house because these sparks are what bring down. When you elevate sparks, it creates an enormous blessing coming from, from above because it brings unbelievable satisfaction to God himself. And as a result of that, he bestows a lot of livelihood, a lot of blessing into the Shekhinah so she can feed all the souls and all the angels and her entire holy constituents. Her children, she has to feed them. With what? She goes to hunt. She goes into the dark side to extract the spark. The Ainu Lavar in order to purify to, to, to purify. 
Biru, and to clarify, which means Biru de Noiga to take the Birurim, which are sparks of holiness, from the Klippa. The Klippa is called one of the Klippas, where most of the work of, of extracting sparks from an unholy place is called the Klippa of Noga, the glowing shell, because over there, there is the main mixture of good and evil. And from that place, you have to extract the sparks. The Biya of Bri Yitzir and Asiya, Shanaf Lubehem, because the sparks of holiness have fallen over there. What are the sparks doing in the klipa? So he explains. Because primordially it once fell down at Eish Pechas The 288 sparks of holiness that have fallen down, and those 288 become billions of sparks scattered in, 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 all, in all physical matter, but not only physical matter, in all the entire, um, in, on all levels of existence, that we call klipa, there's sparks of holiness. Now, now, when she goes down, which means she herself descends in order to rectify, which we said happens during the time of exile or every night time, she doesn't become completely invested. She leaves a little, little, little part of her her very inner inner core remains always above it all. Let's explain that. I'll, I'll first say what it is. The, the Shekhinah is made up of 10 Sephirot. She herself is Malchut, which is the 10th Sephira, but she has, her buildup is from the 10 higher Sephirot. So she herself has the Chachma of the Malchus, the Bina of the Malchus, the Das of the Malchus, so forth. All the way down to the Malchus of the Malchus. When she descends down at night to make herself vulnerable and as a result of that to extract, only the lower nine sephirot in her go down. But her essence, which are, is her keta, her crown, always remains in her, attached to her source above. She doesn't completely disconnect because then there would be no return. So she always like sets herself kind of, she ties herself above so that she can go down. And let's give an example in our human experience. Our souls go down, become enclosed in our animal soul and in our bodies. And we, and, 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 and we engage in life. And in that process of engaging in life, we manage to elevate a lot of things. But as we said before, in the process of elevating, engagement, there's always, it's an argument. There's a back and a forth. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. It's back and forth. Sometimes the unholy gets you to do unholy things with your neshama. So your neshama is leaking energy into the clip. The opposite can also happen, which is the, 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 the point of it all, is that your soul should inspire your body with your animal soul to get involved in doing holy things. So you're taking physical energy and integrating it into holiness. So that's when you're taking from unholy into holy. And you realize there's a powerful, powerful um, and we understand that there's a powerful, powerful, um, 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 uh, you know, uh, you call it tension pull, you know, a, a, a confrontation over here. A word that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm not finding right now. There is a, a wrestling going on. Each one is trying to overpower the other. But here's the thing. Deep inside each and every one of us, there is a sacred space. And that space never becomes enclosed in the battle of life. It's very pure and very holy. It knows the truth and never becomes, never gets convoluted. And that's our essence of our soul. It's just that it's not in our consciousness. It's in our super consciousness. When we're lucky, let's say, what's the power of Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur is a day which is conducive and it's set that way, that that, inner core that has never gotten dirty and has never been never become soiled by the by the by the uh by life by the material physical life uh, we, we tap that we feel that and that kind of can reboot our entire soul it can it can repurify our entire consciousness you know, all year long we don't access that but on yom kippur bank that place opens up so that's an example that there is there is the highest part of our soul is always is we can always fall back on that. We can always get, we can always regenerate our connect. Even when we fall and we do all terrible things and we fall into sin and to dark things, we can always get up again. 
because there is the essence of our soul never gets contaminated. That's the point. So as it is in our own individual soul, so too it is the cosmic soul called the Shekhinah. Her keter, her crown, is always unified, above creation, unified, knows the truth. The outer element of the Shekhinah gets, start, comes into the world and, so to speak, gets pulled into the ideas and the negativity that, that happen on the various levels of existence by the unholy angels and unholy entities that are out there. And pull holy energy into these things. And again, that too is so that in the end, she gets the upper hand and pulls out. Not, not only does she ret retrieve her energy, but she retrieves even a surplus, as we mentioned earlier. So that's what he brings over. The nine sefirot of her, they descend into the three lower worlds, to go down and to be active, to get, it, to get so to speak, her hands dirty in this purification process. But her crown remains above in the world of Atsilas, the world of emanation. Now, where do we know that there's always a part of her that remains above? There's a verse that says, forever, O God, your words. Malchus is called the word of God. So we say, forever, God, your word. Nitzav is standing Bashamayim. What does it mean, your word is standing Bashamayim? It means that your word which is the power of divine speech, which is Ishkina, is always above. It's always in Atzilut. It's always in heaven. It's always in that godly state. Now there's a little parenthesis over here that becomes extra Kabbalistic. I'm going to read it very quickly. So it says in Priyat Chaim, he's proving this idea that the upper point of Malchus never descends. So it says in the writings of the Holy Ari, in Priyat Chaim, Shah Yud Zayim, Perik Beit, the Ramas, the Hine, Metzasi, we turn over the page. Kosev Hetzli, so it says in these two places, Sharitzin is a certain a certain prayer book, a tefillah, a, 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 a siddur that was written with Kabbalistic uh, thing. In Ramaz, however, it uh, it it seems to accept what it says elsewhere in Priyat Chaim. That even the keter of, Mal, of, of the Shekhinah of Malchus does go down, uh, at least in the chamber of the Holy of Holies of the world of Bria. In other words, enters into creation consciousness, into, into the world of Bria, and leaves the pure Atsilus state where you see there is nothing but Hashem. And the test and the nine spheroids get it included in Leia. Exactly what that means is not for now. But he's asking a question that elsewhere it seems to imply that there is even a descent in the highest point of Malchus. So the Tzemach Tzedek says, If you look at Migdash Melech, which is a commentary on the Zohar, Pashas Emma Dav Tzadik Omed Aleph. Which he's quoting over there, the, the words of Reb Chaim Vital, the chief disciple of the Hari. The Pidish Mashakosa the Zohar, explaining what it states in the Zohar. At the time when Knesset Yisrael, when the Shekhinah is, is, is inspired. So then he says, the nine Nekudos, Shebebriya, the nine parts of her that have descended in Bria are now elevated. So that proves this point that only the nine points of Malchus go down, not her tenth point, which is her highest. Mashma Kamoshe Kasafi implies, like we've written over here in the Mimer, that, that the Shekhinah doesn't descend completely. There's a part of her that's always tied up above. He also says it again in another place in the name of the Reb Chaim Vital, the Gamal Kutishat Larizal, bringing a whole bunch of sources for this. In the in the in the Lakute Hashas explanations of Talmud, also from the Arizal of Tezaina Amedalid, the Ramas Choda, Masha Amen Azal Achiyom Matias Atzbache. Over there, it also Kosev. There he says clearly, Avala Keser Einoi Zazmen Makaymai. Keser never leaves its 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 lofty place. Chulo Ein Shom Venirshem Shom Aravzal. And over there, it says that he heard this from the Rav. Kenereshim Arizal Atzmai. That that is not even from Reb Chaim Vital, a student, but that was actually a writing. That the holy Ari had written himself. It was the highest authority, and Kabbalah is always the Ari. So when you have a direct 
teaching that you know was not an interpretation from any of a student, but it was the area itself, that that overpowers any other statements from anybody else. Although we need to then understand this, that it applies in another place in Priyat Chaim. Again, I'm just reading this quickly because I don't want to skip. I'm not planning to explain this too much. How this fits with what it says in Eitz Chaim and Shamim Ches, the Indian is Lapshus Teshvidishullah, and Kamakaimai, he himself says, This is not, this this discussion, its place is not for here. So it, there is what to talk about, but that to reconcile these places and to explain that, but that's not in this mime. I'm Ramaz Resh Pasha Sav, look also in the, in the book of Ramosh Zakuti, in the beginning of Pasha Sav, Mashkos begin Chiamati. Kesar is not counted. It's her root. It's, this is her inner point. And therefore, it always remains aloof and above. And similar to that in our own soul, there's always a point which never gets contaminated by life. Okay. Once we understand this concept, we say that the Shekhinah, similar to our soul, is coming down. And the purpose of the descent is to make a to elevate sparks. Now he's going to explain the part of us that does get engaged in the world is meant to elevate. So he's going to explain how does that elevation happen. We say the Shekhinah also, she goes down at night or she goes down during the time of exile and the purpose is to extract sparks of holiness. So what does that mean? Which is all a preparation that the whole world then can become holy and receptive for God's light and for Hashem's, not just light, for Hashem's presence in the days of Mashiach. So this concept of this purification is going to explain now. And what's this idea of this clarification, this purification that has to happen? This pur purpose is to elevate the sparks of holiness. The Haina, which means to take the food out from the from the from the peels. Okay. When you when you um you know buy uh you know go to Trader Joe's and buy uh, a pack of uh, peanuts or a pack of, um, I don't know, any other kind of, uh, whatever, wherever you're going to shop. You know, Trader Joe's, they have already uh, most of these things all peeled. But if you go to whatever you're going, you're getting uh, almonds when they're still in their shells. So you can't eat it as it is. You have to crack open the shell, take, and then select the, the, the nut that's inside, whether it's the walnut, whether it's the, the, the chestnut, or whatever it is, you're taking, you're taking out of the peanut out of the shell. So, but initially it's a mixture or you eat the green, the green peas they usually give you when they have the, the sushi, whatever they call those. So there is the, you have to, you know, you have to, you have to, you have to like crack open that outer shell and take out the, 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 the edible part that's in it. So that concept of separating the good from the bad, so there are sparks of holiness, obviously it's not visible to the eye. It's a divine energy that's within every creature and every being, even the material things that we come into contact with. Even if you say, you know, you have an apple. The apple is a physical physical entity. Well, and it's unholy. The reason it's unholy, because looking at the apple, just from, without having prayed and learned and studied three hours over here Friday with me over here at this class, or I don't mean only with me, with anybody, without having stunned this deep meditation where Hopefully, this study, this deep study, which it trains our eyes to see an apple differently. But if you don't, and you just, you know, like, well, millions of people walk into a supermarket, Ralph's, wherever you're shopping, and, 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 and a farmer's market, and you see a bunch of apples. What is apples? Apples is uh, something here. Like if you're a Jew, you have to stop for a moment, take the apple, and you have to stop and think. I say, I'm going to thank God for giving me this beautiful apple. And you say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Okeinu Melech Olam, Borei Priya Eitz. Thank God, the Lord of the whole world, who created the fruit of the tree. It's not just a tree that produced an apple. It's God's infinite energy flowing in the earth, which is producing the tree, which is producing and flowing into this, into the branches and the twigs until it comes down into this one place to produce this this magnificent apple and the juice and the taste and all this is all is all expressions of God's infinite. Ability to express himself as ultimately as this apple, because his entire because the apple is nothing more than a divine energy, a mixture of divine words that make up this apple. So when you recognize that, then that's the spark. You've uncovered the godliness of it. And then when you eat the apple, and 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 being that you're a human being, God has created you with the need to be sustained by food. 
So now let's say the apple is going to sustain you for two hours or three hours. Give you energy. And during this energy, you're going to live in godly consciousness. You're going to say, I'm going to now, you know, do something good for the world. I'm going to go to the hospital. I'm going to go to the old age home. I'm going to make people happy. Those people are sad and depressed because that's what God wants me to do. And with that energy, and for two hours, three hours, you're not thinking of food because you have energy from the apple you ate. So you just now elevated that into a godly state because you re, you, you, you've, you've uncovered its godly energy. You've revealed it. You put it to use for a godly purpose or any other good thing you will do. Now, but the apple is mixed good and bad because you could take the apple, eat it, munch it without a blessing, without giving it two seconds of thought, and then use that energy and just, you know, you're not hungry while you're watching television. You're watching Netflix. You're watching a movie. What's godly about it? Nothing. Any godly consciousness? No. It's actually a violent movie. Or, and it's putting junk in your head. And you're not hungry right now because you ate your apple. So now this energy is, is mahat, mahat. You ask yourself a question. How is it that I'm abusing something that God created? I'm sitting here watching this movie for no reason. I'm not doing anything. And I took an apple. I know I paid for it with my money, but it's not really mine ultimately because God is creating the apple every second. Like what gave me the right to eat this apple now and use the energy when what is being, what is being improved in this world through me? I'm going to be watching this movie and, or I don't know, whatever else I'm doing. I'm not doing anything godly. I'm not doing anything holy. I'm, I give an example of doing something negative. But not even if it's, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about like gross, bad. You didn't go out and kill anybody, but you just wasted life. On, 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 on meaninglessness, you, we all do that. I'm guilty of that as well. We all stop and get distracted and sometimes eat food. And then you don't use that energy immediately, constantly in a constructive, godly way. We use it a lot of times just to waste time, especially if it's being used for a sin. That's like really terrible. I mean, one is, one is going to go engage in a negative behavior and from the food that they ate. So now when you look at the apple, is the apple holy or not holy? Well, it depends what you do with it. If you will take the apple and use it for good things, then the energy will be revealed that it's God. That means there's a spark of holiness there. But there's a lot of klipa in the apple itself, which means it's blocked. The very fact that one can ignore the godly energy that's in that apple and dismiss it completely. Not even, I mean, it doesn't even enter your mind. And you can just see the apple as a, as a source of nourishment for and, 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 and to sustain life, but life that's meaningless, life that's not attached to source, that means that the, that's the dark side of the apple. So the apple is the example. The same is true about a pair of shoes and about a car and about gasoline that you put in your car, fuel you put in your car. It's true about your computer. It's true about your, iPhone, your phone, your everything. It's all material object that is created by God. It has spark of holiness. Because the very, the very, the very, what's making it be from not to be is a divine energy. When we are living in a higher state of mind and a higher state of consciousness, then we're utilizing, we're uncovering the spark of it. We're integrating it into godliness, into the holy. And if not, it's, 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 it's in the unholy. So that's what he's explaining there. Because the sparks of holiness, that have fallen into the three lower Lower, lower worlds. Bria Yatsiri Nasi. In creation, there's a big mixture of good and bad. Even on this more spiritual levels, there's a mixture of good and bad. And it has fallen the Klippa Snoga into the Klippa, Klippa, the shell, which is blocking. Now, mostly, we, we would say, let's take apples. What do you think? I don't know how many apples are consumed every day across the planet, but I would assume. You know, millions of apples are consumed every day across the world. How many of those apples are eaten and then the energy used consciously in a consistent manner to serve God's interests? Not too many. So that means the potential for it to be used to good is overpowered by most of it is lending itself to, again, not necessarily bad, but but what, what we call bad is what is not recognizing truth. What is not recognizing that God is truth and his, his will and a world that is reflecting him and expressing him, that's goodness. Anything that's not attached to that is already called 
unholy, non-godly. And it's already klip, it's part of the shells. So he's saying over here that the impurity that's in the world is more than the, than the potential, than the good. Um, li like you see in many things that you have, the fruit is small, but the shell is very big. The shell is bigger than the fruit. Where the, where the good is mixed. The good is, and the good is so, it's mixed so much in it. You know, you, it's like when you it mine silver, the silver is mixed with, with impurities, with dregs. Now, how do you fix silver? When you mine silver, it's the silver, but the silver has got, in that metal, it's got a lot of junk. So that silver is not ready to be put on a beautiful dining room table. It's not ready. Only when it will be shiny silver. How will you make it shiny silver? You have to put the silver into a hot, hot, hot oven. It will heat it up. It will melt it. Once it's melted, then you can... Um, I'm not a silversmith, but there is a there, there is that that process of being able to separate the dregs, the dark, the the the, the, the whatever is not the schmutz, if you call it, from it, and then it re remains pure silver. The 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 separation or the half it is to separate the good from the bad. The built of and they shouldn't be any more um, mixed together. Now here's the thing. Once you extract the goods from the bad, evil on its own has no existence without its the divine energy that's within it. So automatically it disintegrates, dissolves, and is destroyed. And then the ra, the evil, misparate, gets separated, and it falls below. It falls below. It's like you have, like we say, lies. Um, someone comes in, I don't know, in a court case or something, and they, you know, two people litigants. One of them is a massive liar. The other one is, you know, hopefully mostly right. The other one is like a massive liar. And 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 and, but you know, in the lies, there's a little bit. You know, how, how do you, if you if you come in and you say explicit, outright lies that are like super lies, then there's nothing. You know, then obviously everybody sees you're lying. So you have to take the lies and camouflage it, pick up little, 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 little pieces of truth, little half events. You stick it into your lie and that you can say, see, this happened or that happened, the boom, 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 boom. And based on that, you want to create this humongous, bogus story based on these half little truths which are supporting you. So how does, how do you cause it, the entire thing to collapse? So you have to come and shine light and you say, okay, this that you're mentioning, this, this, yeah, this, this, this happened. But this happened only in the context of so and so, not the way you're saying it. And then you bring in all the all the various different parts. You're actually picking out the little bits of truth, severing it from the lies. And then what's left afterwards is just one big, big, big heap of lies. And once the heap of lies is left, it's dismissed. No one wants to look at it anymore. It becomes so despicable and so disgusting that it's like rejected completely. That's a, that's the idea. Every court of law is really supposed to be doing if the judge is not corrupt and the lawyer and, and we have a, 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 an honest system and that's part of what what a law uh, a, a law uh, um, a court of law is supposed to do is to separate the lies from the truth clarify and then the rest of it falls apart so the same is also on the spiritual level once you take the good out, you utilize, in, the, in other words, once you utilize the good energy for something that is within the world for goodness, all the impurity just falls away automatically. And the sparks of holiness, which is the good that became extracted, gets elevated above. It becomes the feminine water that goes up. Nikolobatsilus to go back up to its source. The spark now travels back up to its source. And I give you an example of that. What does that mean? Once that you extract and it goes up, the good goes up and the bad disintegrates and disappears. Let's take a look at our own souls, the mixture of good and bad, and the separation. And the filtering experience that takes place in the soul of man. Where do we have that? 
In the our, in our animal soul, our animal consciousness is a big mixture of good and bad. Now, generally, when we look at ourselves. See, we have to understand we are all a godly soul enclosed in an animal soul. So we have to accept the fact that that's the reality. We're in an animalistic soul. The animalistic soul is generally our, it's more of our immediate consciousness, our natural consciousness. And we have to dig deeper to uncover and to connect to our higher consciousness, which is, which is our soul. Now, someone can say, I'm a pretty good guy. I try to keep the mitzvot. I um, don't sin. Whatever is explicitly a sin, I don't do. See, many times we look and we know, sadly, that we're weak people and we do sometimes commit certain sins. That we don't necessarily power them. We are then we at least acknowledge. But uh, sometimes we are pretty good. You know, I look at myself in the mirror and say, "I'm pretty good. I'm a pretty good human being. I'm a pretty good Jew. I, 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 I whatever I'm supposed to do, I do. What I'm not allowed to do, I don't do." And then we become kind of self, become complacent because we're pretty good. So he says, "Vagam shu oisa mitzvahs." Now, but if we if we would put ourselves under a really really introspection and if we would shine a powerful light on our on ourselves we would see that even when we think we're really good there is a lot of unholiness there there's a lot of dark stuff so if you're looking at it from a distance just superficially yeah you, i can pass as a very good human being i'm doing everything good in this world i give charity i do my mitzvahs i daven every day i study a little torah i kind of would pat myself on the back he says, the Alter Rebbe says, hold it. Now, now when, when, I'm, when I'm behaving this way, it's obviously I've trained my animal soul to be this way. Fine. So he says, I'm only doing mitzvahs. If it ain't no there, let's say I find myself in a situation where I know I don't do sin. Whatever I know is forbidden, I've not been doing. The Alter Rebbe says, but it doesn't mean you're not a mixture anymore of good and bad. Hidden, deep inside, they're still bad. Yesh by hara, they're still bad shahare. First of all, even if you're not going to sin the sin, you're not doing the sin, but the fact that inside of you, at times when you see something that triggers your fantasy, your friend's mind, you start experiencing desires to sin. Now, you're doing the right thing by, by controlling it, that's, and that's a big mitzvah. When we have an urge to do bad stuff and we don't do it, it's awesome mitzvah, but it doesn't mean... That when I that, that I'm a tzaddik. A tzaddik means someone, a righteous individual, means that the someone only has good. I don't know. The fact that I'm still burning up with a desire and, 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 and to do it, even if I control myself and I don't do it, means that there is. So even if I'm looking at my most outer surface, my behavior is impeccable. I'm doing mitzvahs and I'm not sinning. Doesn't mean there isn't bad. First of all, the fact that I'm able to have this uh, unholy lusts, desires, and wants. Or I can experience real greed and 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 envy and and then okay, like I can't stand someone else's success and I'm jealous of their success and things like that. Even if I won't say anything and I won't do anything, I'll keep it inside. But the fact that that's going on means there's a big chunk of of it simply means there's work to do. That's the point. Because we could improve it, we could lessen that, we can change that. I mean, if, of course, if we couldn't change it, then that's the best we've got to work with, fine. But God gave us an ability to, to improve. doesn't mean that we can become a full tzaddik, but we can make that negative side in us be less and less and less. But first, we have to acknowledge that we have a mixture. That's the point. The oid zois, and you even look more. You can even look even deeper, he says. How about, and what we're saying now is, I'm doing. I'm learning a lot of Torah, doing a lot of mitzvot. But from time to time, I have thoughts of doing other stuff. Although I don't allow those thoughts to to manifest, but the fact that I have thoughts of doing is already showing that there is still work to do in terms of elevating my consciousness, purifying my inner world. But now he's taking it a step deeper. Let's go back to the mitzvahs you're doing, the good you're doing, which you're totally satisfied because you're saying, "Wow, I'm learning. I'm doing charity. I'm doing mitzvahs. I'm helping people." I'm doing. Uh -huh. The Alter Rebbe says, let's take a light, a powerful godly light. Let's turn on the light and examine. And we will see a lot of black dots in the good. Why? 
Because when you're doing a mitzvah, what's a mitzvah? A mitzvah is God's will. And the mitzvah should be done wholeheartedly because God wants it. If I'm doing the mitzvah, and while I'm doing the mitzvah, I'm thinking about my own gain that I'm getting, then it's not really fully devoted to Hashem. It's about me, not about God. I want certain things out of the mitzvah. It can be very superficial. I want to impress other people. That's like really superficial and really external and really not, not refined. But even if I'm not thinking about others, I'm thinking about myself. But I, I you know, my mitzvah observance about makes me feel good instead of it being, I'm, I'm fulfilling my creator. What's goodness? Goodness is the acknowledgement and the recognition that God is and there's none but him. And therefore, I just want to be, I want to live in that truth. I want to do his will because his will should, and I, I, I it's the incredible zechut that I can just be this 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 channel for, for for holiness to come through me. God's will should be fulfilled through me. That's like the biggest honor that can be. That's holiness. But when it starts becoming about, you know, me feeling good about myself and I want whatever, that's already. I'm not saying it's better than doing bad stuff, but it, it's a mixture of good and bad still. There, there's a there is there's an otherness there that's not the purity of the that of Hashem's unity that Hashem is and and everything is in a mitzvah and when we're doing godly things we're supposed to be including ourselves in God's unity and through us to express that He is true reality. <laughs> As he says, it's possible that even the Torah and the mitzvahs that we do are not pure and designated completely. To fulfill the will of God. Without any personal um, other gain. Pnia means a, a um, your mitzvah should be altruistic. They should not be self based on self interest. Give us out of because it mixed in this a Pnia even on the in the innermost, if you'll really inspect it, you'll see that there's a lot of 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 things that you're doing because you're making calculations. How by doing this, it's gonna it's gonna better me. It's gonna you know it's gonna improve my position in 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 whatever in the community and so on and so forth. I'm gonna be seen as you know we spoke earlier as as a philanthropist, as a communal communal this, and it will add to my honor. So it's not about God. Nimtza comes out, there's a mixture of good and bad. Even in the good that we're doing, even in the, the study of Torah and the mitzvahs, which are the garments of Torah and mitzvahs that a person is fulfilling. We don't, that, that's the garments. And, and for sure, right, we don't even have to say, the Pnimi Samidis the Nefesh Bahamas. That when we're going deep inside our animal soul over there, and you haven't done the work to really convert that animalistic drive within the person to change it from its natural state, and it's out of the birth, and it states from birth. And in their teva, in other words, if you didn't really work to change it naturally, it's going to be very self centered, it's going to be a mixture of good and bad. Why? Because our animal, it's not your fault. It was taken, the animal soul was taken from the klipa, from the cosmic klipa that God created, which is a mixture of good and bad. It's a little piece, your own animal soul, a little piece, our own animal souls, a little piece from that. And therefore, yeah, so if you, if, if you didn't do work to change it, then naturally, if you're leaving it just in its natural state, if you haven't done deep psychological work on its natural state, it is in an unholy state. Because it's taken from the klipa. It's mixed good and bad. As it is not. Okay, so that's the state that a person is on their own. Now he's going to explain, so how do you take the silver and you clean it? How do you take the animal soul and separate the good from the bad? So number one, the separation means first to acknowledge it, to identify it. As long as a person is walking around thinking they're so perfect and they're so great because they're so good and so on and so forth, they're not fixing anything. So the bad is mixed in their good. So there has to be a, 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 an exercise which helps you realize and detect. And once you detect that there's certain things that are not, that are from the other side, from unholiness, you start disliking it. And the very element of disliking it is already separating it. 
You're separating the good that's there from the bad, and that helps it fall. That helps the evil just disintegrate. Just the fact that you're un, you know, the, the, the negative latches itself onto the holy. That's when you do it. We're talking about a thing that we said earlier. You're doing mitzvahs, you're doing good things, but your personal selfish motives of the animal so latches itself onto every mitzvah you do to, to make the mitzvah also be done to support one's uh, personal, you know, uh, personal gain. So that's exactly what we spoke earlier, that the klipa derives energy from. In other words, I can, I can you know, be very selfish and, and, and be caught up with my, myself and not really care truthfully about something bigger than me and definitely not about other people. Possible. And here's an amazing thing, which is a frightening thing. Sometimes the very fact that I'm doing, that I'm religious or doing a lot of good stuff Instead of that increasing holiness inside of me, it can be doing the total opposite because it could be another form of validation and another form of endorsement of what an unbelievable person I am. And therefore, that can make me like 10 times more selfish and therefore more rude to my spouse and more expectations of other people's and get more insulted when other people have slighted my honor. So I'm becoming more disconnected from God, from the very mitzvot that I'm doing. That's the concept we're learning, that the unholy can sometimes attack the holy and derive energy from the holy. And it's possible a person, however, is not oblivious, is, is oblivious, I'm sorry, is oblivious of it. They're not realizing, they're not feeling it. They're kind of, you know, because they're... So how do you create that separation? So you have to become sensitive you become sensitive to the to the to the coarseness of self. How do we become sensitive to the coarseness of ego? How do we realize that we're not refined? It's by expanding our our consciousness of God. The more and clear it becomes, the truth that He is and there's none but Him, and all of existence is being created every second from absolute nothing. And if you think about it and think about it, you can almost touch it. It becomes so clear. Then you start sensing how, how disconnected you are, how much you, you think about yourself and you're not part of that oneness. And you start becoming abhorred and disgusted by, by the brazenness of your own ego. And you start saying, Feh, this is despicable. How dare I do God's, God's mitzvah? And I'm thinking not of God, but I think about myself. That's despicable. You start becoming angry and this is, this is a healthy experience. You start becoming angry at that, at that, at that, at that density of your consciousness. That itself is like doing this deep surgery. It's cutting away the klipa. And it's and it's and it's it's allowing the goodness that you're doing to be pure. But that, that's what he says. That's where prayer comes in, because prayer elevates our consciousness. When one prays in, with intent, that means this doesn't work if you're just praying. Saying words if you're davening. But if you're davening with deep intent, they shall have shall never shall kiss, throw so through the flames of love of the godly soul. That comes from the contemplation in the greatness of Hashem. That separates the good from the bad. The I know, which means that's when a person can find and see. That's when you're contemplating Hashem's greatness and it starts becoming, that's when you also start realizing how far you are. Then I realize that all the good that I do is not pure. And it's not selflessly devoted to Hashem. Like, like, like you should. And it's interesting. A person can pray and be and realize their their own coarseness, and as a result of that, reject, start becoming more sensitive about doing things with a more pure motive, and they can reach a certain level of selflessness in their service. But it's a level, and then they can have another experience of prayer. I would say, let's say they pray for a while like this, and then they stop or whatever, and then they start again. And they start experiencing deeper prayer because prayer is like exercise. The more you do it deeply, 
the more the higher you can go, the more the more connection you can experience when you're praying, which means the the more the deeper your con- one's consciousness of God can become. It's like an exercise. You can't you can't run uh you know uh, thirty miles the first day. You can't. I, the other day I was hiking. I saw these bikers. They bike and go up this mountain, and I'm blown away. I'm blown because I bike as well. But I try to go I, every day. I have my bike route that I take another every day, but a few times a week. Something when I'm if I'm behaving. Um, there's a hill that I go up on the street, and I'm huffing and puffing like crazy to get up that hill. I manage, but it's not such a big hill. It's just one block that goes up and then down. And the time I get there, I'm like pooped. The, 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 these bikers, they're going up, 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 up. And I, I said to them, I said, I can't believe how you're doing this. They said, well, it takes 10 years of diligent showing up every day, bang, and then you can go up. So the same is with prayer, spiritual exercise. You know, you reach higher levels of connection to God. The more you do it, the more you do it. So here's the thing. Once you reach a higher level, then you realize that what you thought yesterday was already pure. That too is so coarse. This is like, it's, 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 it's a process of purification that goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So then you can pick up on the tiniest nuance of selfishness, which, which yesterday you thought is like totally selfless. And today you're picking up that, no, no, no. It's not pure. And you, and, and you do, it's a sense, it's a, it's a chuva process that goes deeper and deeper. Like he explains over here. Because when a person understands and appreciates well, and it becomes very real to you, becomes true by you, to the point where you can almost see it physically. Now, you can almost see the divine with a physical image. See, we speak about God like it's a distant entity. But if you can meditate on prayer a lot, it still starts becoming so vivid. That it's almost like you can see the energy flow of the cosmos. And when you say the cosmos, I mean all the way down here to the physical world around. You can see how everything is just God. And then you can you start to think, ugh, so how does something stand here brazenly and claim and feel itself so much in the presence of the infinite who's right over here? When one contemplates deeply and, and deeply in the greatness of Hashem. And you appreciate the point that there's nothing but Him. As an Alter Rebbe uses such powerful words, as Yevosh, then a person will become embarrassed. The Yikolim, and a person will become ashamed. Memaisa, from his actions. Shumer Bechutz And he, when he says from his actions, of course from sin, we're not even talking about that. But even from the good things you're doing, but when I'm doing it, I'm still outside. I'm not in that state when I'm doing an action of a mitzvah that right now I feel that there's nothing but him and I'm just, my hands and feet are almost like just he, Hashem's hands and feet to get something done. It has nothing with me. It's just, I'm just passing on, like Abraham, Avram Avinu did when he did God's when he did kindness in the world. It wasn't him doing. He was just an he was just like a, an extension of Hashem's hands and feet to be kind in the world. But a person suddenly realizes how stuck up I am in my own self. How do I know? Because when someone doesn't appreciate, I did it. I get all insulted. You didn't give me credit. You didn't tell me thank you. You didn't. Uh, <laughs> what do you mean? I, I gave you a ride to the airport and then you didn't even thank me. Oh, come on, you know. If, if your ride to the airport that you gave this person is because God is doing kindness through you, you know, feeling yourself so much. Okay, so they weren't so appreciative. It doesn't even come. The very fact that it bothers the person is a sign that I'm, I'm too stuck up with myself. As we know. She, he says, if a person becomes embarrassed with the fact, Adayim Chinesiyash, I'm still a somebody, Vidovar, an, an entity. Ule then I'm serving for myself. And but as a result of that, once you can once you can identify it, then the Yashas eight is Benafsha, then you can start figuring out within yourself how to how to get rid of that 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 thickness, that density. He calls it the bad, how to reject it. Nimtza comes out through the prayer nizgalara. Through the prayer, you revealed the bad. Without the prayer, the bad was hiding. It was it was so um, in, in what do you call it insidious? So what was the right word for it? Yeah. The bad was camouflaged. Because you thought you're a good guy, you thought you're wonderful. It was not known at all that it's bad. 
the person in his own eyes was giving himself a stamp of approval. The Yeshara, and it's so good, but now through this purification, this Galara, the negative was revealed, it was exposed. But through it's being exposed and revealed, through that it becomes ejected from good. The good can now be stand on its own. It's not mixed with bad. I'll give you a little, a little story that illustrates this idea. Um, Rabbeinu Sadi Goyen was one of the, I mentioned the story a few times, but it's still good to hear again. Rabbeinu Sadi Goyen, who was the um, one of the great, 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 uh, I think, um, 11th century, I think, maybe 10th century rabbi, um, was, was considered the leader of the Jewish people. He was uh, incredible. Um, those days, there were no pictures and, and, and stuff like that. So he once traveled somewhere, and he ended up in a village, and he decided to go incognito. He didn't tell people who, who he was. And um, someone saw a Jew, and he probably saw, he looked at him, and he could tell on his face that he was special. So he invited this person to his house, this Rabbi Nustad Yugai, and he gave him a beautiful accommodations and a nice, and, a, and, a, and, a, and everything really well. He cooked him and made him a nice breakfast, and he gave him a you know, comfortable bed, for whatever, whatever it was. And they treated him really nicely. And then, a day or two later, I don't know what it was, Rabbi Nusadja Cohen was recognized by someone in the community. And everybody suddenly started like, whoa, they were, they, they, they really rolled out the red carpet. They were excited like crazy. You know what it means? The rabbi of the whole of the he's like, it's almost like the king is here. And it was like the excitement was just beyond. The host who was hosting him, who initially, when he didn't know who he is, came in, fell to his feet, and was crying and crying and crying. And beside you, I said, what's with you? What are you crying? He said, sorry, sorry. He said, what do you mean, sorry? He says, no, I, I didn't treat you well. He said, well, you didn't treat me well. You were so kind. You were so nice. You gave me a nice room. You fed me. You took care of me. He says, yeah, that's for a regular person. I treat all my guests nice if I get someone. But if I had I known that I have the leader of the Jewish people in my house, you know, I would have done who knows what for you. He says, yeah, but it was fine. He says, no, but it was despicable to treat, to, to do, like to, to treat you just the way, that's despicable. So what was yesterday, what, so what happened over here? This guy was doing mitzvahs, he was do, meaning he, he was doing good, but the level of devotion and de dedication that should be when you realize who you go, you do, you're doing it for, should be so much higher, so much purer, so much greater. So what was yesterday considered a positive action was considered to him so negative and so disrespectful that he was crying. He was doing tshuva on it. He was repenting for it. He felt, and Reb Sadi Goyen said, from that person I learned how to do tshuva. Because even if I don't do anything wrong, every day as I grow more and more and more in my life and I gain a deeper appreciation of who God really is, then I realized my entire yesterday service, it was so selfish it was so self-absorbed compared like I, in front of who god is there should be a so much greater sometimes in the story you emphasize more it just be a greater service but sometimes you realize in the point over here is that even that in, in, in the presence of somebody awesome you become tiny and small and if one is not feeling tiny and small that's a sign of real disconnect. That's a sign of real density. So when you realize that you were dense and therefore so disrespectful, if you look at the at the at the Rebbe, at the Lubavitch Rebbe when he's giving dollars or meeting people, so you see the Hasidim walk by and they're terrified. They go, they, they take the doll, they say maybe one word if they have to ask for a blessing. There, there are, there, you can see in them, they're like literally shaking and they get the doll and go. Like, then you have people who, you know, uh, who have no idea what means a tzaddik, no idea what means a person who can see from one end of the world to the other end of the world. I don't want to see what means a holy man who's been in there. And they come because someone decided, you know, bring them to the Rebbe and they come and they talk to the Rebbe and they give the Rebbe their hand. <laughs> and they say, 
uh, Rebbe, and they start talking as if like, you know, and from someone, and why would a chassid not do that? Because a chassid knows a little bit, he has a little inkling, a little inkling with it, and therefore he says, how, how do you even be, how do you even present yourself in such holiness? I say, you want to like find a little hole and go into it and bury yourself, you just want to be a fly on the wall and look from a distance without being noticed. But people who don't know, so because they don't appreciate it, they see a man, okay, they see he's a holy man, they can see in his eyes, they see that he's a, that he's a love, there, but they don't realize anywhere close, so they can still have a certain presence when they're there. But to someone, but that very same individual who says to the Rebbe, Hi, who afterwards, for whatever reason, the Hasidim got him, and he started learning Hasidus, and he started hanging out with Hasidim, and he comes back 10 years later, and now he's approaching the Rebbe with tr trepidation and fear and trembling, and if he watches a video of himself 10 years ago, how he stood in, he's so embarrassed with himself. How dear I stood in front of the Holy of Holies and stood there as if I was who knows what. <laughs> When, when I don't want to say a Rebbe can see all your sins because that's not what the Rebbe is looking for. But like when I'm, how in the world do I stand in front of such holiness and present such beingness? That's the point. So the, he's talking about, the, and obviously with God, it's, a, it's infinite. That the more you appreciate, the more you understand, the more, the more you realize that what, whatever you're doing is so, so unbefitting, especially since God's, and all of his affinity standing over here right now looking at you. And you're doing an act that he asked you to do, and you're doing it with self-interest. It's like despicable. But we don't notice that when we're kind of in the run of things. But when we pray the way we should, and we go into deep prayer, we suddenly start becoming aware of that. And that starts exposing the, self, the, the selfishness. And the more you expose it, the more you isolate it, you get it out, then you can reject it. Say the very fact to say, yuck, that itself separates it from you. And you become more refined in your in your observance. Say so that's this concept he's giving for the example of what he spoke earlier, that the Shekhinah goes down, that our soul comes down on the body. And what's the point for it to enter into a world that's mixed good and bad and to do a separation? See, this kind of separation we can't do if our souls wouldn't be, wouldn't be in the animal soul and it wouldn't be in the body. From up there, we can't do the separation. But to do the separation, you have to be in it. And from within, you got to separate. You got to live within, temporarily within this thickened, dense, impure state where you feel where the, where, where, the, where the concealments and the blockages of the unity of God is very strong. That's our natural consciousness. And from within, you have to struggle your way to appreciate holiness and to try to uncover your soul and connect to God. And in that process, you're cleansing the animal side and the, and the, and the body and so on and so forth and separating good from bad. It's, it happens on an individual level, each and every one of us individually. It happens on a cosmic level where the Shekhinah descends, the power of the divine descends more into the klipas so that it can purify and extract sparks. That's where he's that's where he's developing in this. Are your days and your part of Minatoiv? Okay. By your days and your part of Minatoiv through the separation, it gets separated from the good. The Yishara Toiv Lavada, the good remains alone. The Lita Ruvas Ra without the mixture of bad. That's what we were holding. And just like there is this purification in the soul of man. Shanefesh will kiss the godly soul mevareres as nefesh Bahamas purifies the animal soul. B'shas at tefila at the time of prayer, kach yov and al derech zolamayla will also be understood similar to this above. In yin yiridas amalchus datzilus, the concept of the descent of the malchus level of the world of atzilus, levarer to purify klipas noiga de bia to purify the klipa, the 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 shells of noga of this klipa called the glowing shell that's a mixture of good and bad, in the three lower worlds of Bri Yatsir and Asim. It explains. In Adesh Pechas Natsutsa Kedusha, Shanaf Libra Shvira Sakalim, because the 248 and 288 sparks that are fallen during the shattering of the vessels, which is a primordial collapse, and Muravim Benoida. These are energies that are mixed in the in the klipa. Similar to that mixture of good and bad that we spoke about in our own animal soul. 
Because our, our own animal soul has a, a capacity to do good. But even within the capacity, first of all, it has a capacity to do good. It has a capacity to misbehave. But even in the good we spoke, when it does good, it has self-interest. And it's not, it's a mixture. It's mixed ego and uh, the ability to, for it to hear truth. Well, there's always, so just like it is by us, so to it is in, in, the, in the soul, in, the, in the, the vivifying energy of all of creation, which on the external level is the klipa. Inside of it comes the Shekhinah to purify the good from the bad. So through this, that during the time of exile that we spoke, or daily, every single night, the Malchus, the Shekhinah, goes down into Bria, Yatsir, and Asiya, into the three lower worlds. To make this purification, she separates and... Um, um, she purifies and separates the good from the bad. Because what happens? Hara nifrad, the evil gets separated. The noifel amata falls below. And the 288 sparks, this alam lamayla, they rise upward. Likolel to become included in godliness. But she can only elevate it only when she goes down. Because when she's still in Atsilas, which means when the Shekhinah is still unified with the source over there, in that range, in that place, there is no, there's no mixture. Because there's only holiness there. So she can't fix anything. It's like when someone is, the main fixing of good and bad in our lives is when we go away from the centers of holiness. For example, when we're in shul, when we hang out in a very, very enclosed area of pure holiness, okay, there is also work to do, but it's, it's mainly already, it's already in a good, good environment. It's already everybody of everything and everything in this area is already connected. It's to go into the outside world, into the business world, into the world, into the secular world, into the world where there is no uh, divine awareness. Or if there is, there's potential. People have a sense of it, but not. And there's a lot of mixture and a lot of confusion. And you go in over there and you teach and you inspire and you're involved. That's when you're doing that separation. It's the same as with, with the Shekhinah. When she's up in that above creation, there, there's no klipa. Keep atzilus, because in the world of atzilus, like yigra chera, evil doesn't exist there. Klal, dafa klipa is atzilus, and even though there is such a thing called the klipa, a shell corresponding to the world of atzilus, but they're not in atzilus. They're corresponding to the world atzilus, but of emanation, but they stand in a lower realm. Emo in them gam kim bebria, they stand in bria. Kamosh kaseh berabis boy perik tazvava stayed in midrash rabba. Chapter fifteen, daf kuflamet beis. Hashem bekisa, maybe maybe that's called a dalit. Bekisa shalak kadosh baruch hu on the throne of God, ain davara no geya, no evil can touch. Shenem la yikra hara, evil cannot touch. That means as even though the shechina is attacked and hacked, that's when she descends down into the lower worlds. But as it is in atzilus, no one can. It's untouchable by klipa. He brings like a bunch of sources for that over here. Vegam bebiya. And even in Bri, Yatsir, and Asiya, even there, which are the three worlds, the world of creation, the world of formation, the world of completion, the, 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 the inside of the worlds are all holy. It's in the outer ex external elements of these worlds. He calls it the garments. That's where there is the mixture of good and bad. The Gamba beyond even Bri, Yatsir, and Asiya, Haranim, Tzerak, Balavushim. The evil is only, the negativity is only in the garments to be on. Shasham, Yeshra, over there, there is there is evil already, but in the first world, Bria miutera, a little bit of 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 of, of negativity, and mostly good. Ubi yitzira in the world of formation, it's already be, the world is becoming more pronounced, and therefore more separated from God. And as a result of that, it leaves room to a much greater degree for the thriving of unholiness. Well, be Yitzira, that's why he says in the world of Yitzira, over there it's a half and half. Ubasiya, but when we come down to the world of completion, the Rubaira, it's mostly bad. That's still the spiritual world of completion. Then there is the physical world, which is our world, which is not just mostly bad, it's most as all. That's what it says. Rubai Kekula, it's most as all bad. And the potential for goodness, and the, like how much in the world right now? Think about it, think about the whole planet. 
How much of the 8 billion people in the world right now is in a state of recognition of God's unity and is a state of total surrender to God? How much? <laughs> Very little. Right? Now, we know that we've already purified. Now, the fact that we've done mitzvahs all over the world, we've already changed it. That's true. We don't see it yet, but it's, it has already fundamentally changed. But initially, the physical material world is mostly disconnected. But he says, But even with this, it's all on the external level. The internal is all the divine. And over there, it's all holy. So she goes out into the three lower worlds and into the outside of the world to do a purification. Over here, he says something very special. He says it in Tanya, similar as well. This is a very comforting thought. Based on this, we can see what we see within ourselves. At the time of prayer, there's a very interesting phenomenon. When a person tries to pray, a lot of times, precisely when you sit down and you say, I'm going to have focused prayer, that's exactly when you start feeling all kinds of negative thoughts. More than had you not sat down to pray. That's, that's, uh, you're kind of, you know, cruising through your life. You're kind of okay. When you start trying to pray and concentrate on holiness, suddenly you start experiencing like really unpleasant thoughts. Why is that? So many people derive from that as a sign that it, my prayer wasn't worth anything. Because at my prayer being worth, why am I thinking these? I'm supposed to be concentrating on God. And then these all kinds of thoughts from everywhere is coming into my head. Some of them not so nice. Why is that? So he's explaining, no, 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 that's precisely because you're just right now going into, you're going into the, into the smithery, into the goldsmith's uh, or to the uh, silversmith's place. You're starting to separate. When you're praying is when you're going to start focusing godly light on your mixed animal, animal self. And as a result of this powerful surgery that you're going to do, laser beam, you're going to be bringing in this, you're going to be cutting away these dark things. They know that that's what you're doing. And as a result of that, they want to hold on for their life. So they're going to latch onto you stronger. And that's why they're pumping into your head. These negative thoughts are coming because they realize that you're beginning to shake them off. If you have someone who jumps on your back, he's holding on. You know, you ever play in a swimming pool with someone. You know, my kids, he's playing the swimming pool. They jump on your back. Fine. They're jumping and you're jumping with them. <laughs> but then when suddenly you stop, you know, you're like going to be like a whale like, and you jump up and you want to like throw them off. That's why they hold on tight like crazy because they're grasping because they want to hold on. They don't want to, they want to, they want to let you go because they know they won't, they let go. They're in the water. They're scared. They're thrashing around. They you know what's going to happen to them. <laughs> and maybe that's your game. You want to show how strong they can hold, but whatever it is. That's exactly what happens with the Klippa. The moment you start shaking them, that's when they hold on. They, they sink their nails in. So from the fact that you, that you feel that a person can pray and get negative thoughts, that's not a proof that you're not praying. That's actually a proof that you are praying. And precisely because of that. So don't, don't get, don't, don't get um, frightened. Don't get scared. Stay focused. The thought will come. Stop for, you know, keep, just ignore it. Just ignore it. Don't, don't, don't sit and, you know, try as much as you can just to, those thoughts are banging at your head, not to let them in. Just continue focusing on what you need to focus. And by doing that, eventually they will fall. And you will come out at the end of prayer a much purer person than you were when you went in. But don't get disheartened by the fact that immediately you're feeling it because that's what is going to happen when you're praying. As he says over here, based on this concept that the evil is holding on to the good so that it can have life, the lies. It's like when you start exposing someone's lies, that's when they like try to defend themselves very strongly and try to misdrew that and they're fighting very strongly. As long as you're not provoking it, okay, fine, leave it alone. At the time of prayer. When a person wants to lodge his mind or attach his mind in the greatness of Hashem, exactly then is when it occurs to him foreign thoughts that are very bothersome and very distracting. They distract him. 
All day long, he never had these thoughts. The Indian, and that is as follows, as mentioned above. The Tafkim, it's precisely now that the time of prayer is the time to separate the bad from the good. And to reject it. That's why the clip is now holding on for dear life to connect to the good. The and he doesn't want to separate from the good. Why? Because his entire energy is from the good. And on his own, he doesn't have um, energy. By the way, th- this idea explains everything that's happening in in the world, in America, and in many places today. It's just that I, I don't want to talk because I can't talk politics. Because then, you know, I don't know who we can offend over here and so on and so forth. But if you're taking a look and you're seeing what's going on around, you can see that that which is lying and that which is deceptive and then is fighting so ferociously just to maintain its, 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 its existence. It's fighting so ferociously. It's bumping. It's like out there fully in full in full armor. The reason is because they sense so clearly that any second, you know, they're losing their existence because they're losing all their power and all their influence. And the reason for that is because all the good has already been extracted. They're holding on just to a little bit of lies, so to speak. They're still a little bit deceptive holding on. And and that's why they're fighting like 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 they they, they they for their life and that's the state that we're what we're watching now. So sometimes we get very disheartened by the fact that on the one hand we say Mashiach is about to come, but on the other hand we see such a a empowerment from the dark side that's in the world now and so intense and intense. So we say, how can it be the time of Mashiach if Mashiach is a time when godly light and and truth will prevail over the world and lies and deception are so strong but here's the point it's exactly the second before they fall that they hold on for dear life and they're, they're thrashing around and trying to impose their 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 worldview on the, on everybody because they're trying to keep in power but they're falling that's the idea it's the same idea that we're learning over here on a personal level that happens during davening which isn't the case all day long when you're not threatening them and when the rest of the day, when you're not in the time of the separation of good and bad, that's when the negative is lodged in the good, and the two of them are mixed together. And the, 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 that which is negative doesn't feel threatened that it will be, its source of life will leave it. And you shake it, and it's calm, it's relaxed, it's going around doing its business because it's not feeling that it's being. It, it's kind of in a very calm state. If you see it start bubbling, you know that it's feeling very threatened. And the same is also understood above. When the Shekhinah comes down, when the Shekhinah comes down to elevate the 288 sparks, which is really, as we spoke earlier, the billions of sparks that are here within the world that need elevation. Right? And it's threatened because it knows that once, what does it mean, the, the clarification? The elevating a spark means separating the truth from the lie, separating the what is what is real from what is not real. So the, when the clip of feels that, it, it knows that the extraction is about to happen, it sinks its, its, its nails in or its teeth in, and it too wants to join in that elevation. It too wants to be validated. It wants to ascend. Now, this concept is a phenomenal concept that says in Priyat Chaim, which applies today to Friday. Friday, we know that it's a mitzvah to shower on Friday. And according to um, Allah, you're supposed to try to shower and it should be with hot water. Not enough, it's, not a, it's not good enough to take a cold shower. One should take a hot shower on Erev Shabbos. And the reason for that is, obviously you can say, because hot water cleans you better. Yeah, but there's a deeper meaning. Because everything in the physical is a reflection of the spiritual. What happens on Shabbos is that on Friday night, as Shabbos comes in, the general Shekhinah is elevated from her investment in the world. The power, the divine power of godliness that has been invested in this world that we spoke earlier, that comes down every night especially, to engage in this battle of purification. In our own lives, what, how is that reflected? 
the fact that during the week, we, as parts of the Shekhinah, are invested in life. That means we're all out doing mundane stuff in the world. People are in, out in their business, in their offices, and so on and so forth. In the world, we're not disconnected. We're, in, we're engaged in the world. And that's so that we can access all these sparks of holiness and connect to them and retrieve it all, fine, through using all the money that we get and all the good that we get and use it in a positive way. But during the week, we're like within. Come Shabbos, what happens? The Shekhinah leaves, goes back up, and all of her children, which are all the Jewish souls, are ascending from their involvement in the material world, and we're going to spend Shabbos just with Hashem. What happens is, as the Shekhinah is, is leaving with a powerful, that's, that, that's the whole idea of the Kabbalah Shabbos, the, the Friday night prayers that are leading into Shabbos, is this yearning of the Shekhinah, the, 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 the bride, the Shekhinah is rising upwards. All souls are in this powerful quest to, to reconnect to their source above, to the godly infinite. Fine, what happens? The Kalipa wants to join along for the ride. The unholy wants to come along because, again, if they're left alone, they become very weak. They, they have no life to them. So they try to jump on and join along for the ride. So the Zohar says what happens right before Shabbos. The Zohar says Hashem takes a whip or whatever, spirit, a fire, and, and whips the Kalipa. It gives it like a lash. It like whips the Kalipa, and that's what creates the Kalipa to separate. That fire is supposed to enter into our shower. It is a crazy idea. When you're taking a hot shower, it's part we're tapping into that, that heat, that godly, which helps take the spiritual dirt, the klipa, and keep it off your body and allow you to enter Shabbos without all these parasites following you. That's the point. To chase the parasites away and that you should be able to enter into Shabbos with your pure soul and without a whole army of Klippa coming in together with you into your Shabbos space, we have to bring you in and keep them out. And that's this hot, this, this hot, the hot shower from before Shabbos. In the writings of the Holy Ari, when he's giving the mystical in, um, intentions that you should have when you're bathing, when you're washing, when Erev Shabbos. And it says it should be Bacham and it should be only in hot. This is the flame of fire. That is drawn from above. To reject and to throw the klipa, the unholy, to throw them away. The klipa should not come up. Only the internal godliness that we've extracted from the klipa. All the good that we've done during the week is elevated, but the shells and the external stuff remain down in the external outside of the world. The Zero Shaamar, and this is what we say in Davening. We actually say it Friday night. Fire goes before him. And it burns Saviv. Around him, tsar of his enemies. The enemies, that which is not meant, that which doesn't belong in the inside, gets burnt by this fire. It's almost like this is like a force of electricity that shocks them and keeps them away and allows holiness to go up without the klipa. It's a stun gun. That's what it is. It's a, it's a taser. God tases the klipa so that they stay out so, and, and, the, and the holiness can go in. The shalogis alu shouldn't go up. Only the sparks of holiness, Levadam alone, that they have that they have been separated. Because once it's been throughout our work during the week, which we clarify good from bad, which we spoke earlier, happens through prayer and through all the moments of of of, of tshuva that we do and all the improvement that we become. Hopefully, our journey in life is supposed to become more selfless and more God God conscious. And what was once part of us becomes rejected. We peel away the outer external elements. And, and, and so the first part is to separate, that we, that we can differentiate what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's not good. And we, and we pick up on the subtleties that we spoke earlier and reject that. Then once it's rejected, it still exists, but it, and it wants to follow us in our journey up. So what happens is that's when they get this spiritual tasing that tases the klipa, keeps it out, and allow holiness to enter and, and not the unholy. And therefore, going back to prayer, a person should not be fallen in their heart. This, that one experiences negative thoughts. During prayer. And as a result of that, someone should come to the conclusion. That my prayer is not worth anything. This is the way it is. Also in these ref refinements, 
above in this purification. That 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 whenever a holiness is extracting and going up, the unholy is is makes an extra effort to 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 attach itself and to hold on strong. So when it happens during prayer, it means that you're doing exactly what you should be doing. Don't pay attention and don't get disheartened by it. Just keep on praying. What you should do is you shouldn't like start debating with it. You should just keep on whenever you you see a thought is going into a negative uh, into anything that is outside of the prayer, just steer the thought back in towards prayer. Just keep on. It's like you ever go horse on a horse. So when you're going horseback riding, sometimes your horse it sees it sees um, you know it sees grass or whatever, and the horse right away bends down. They want to eat. So what do you do? You're going to start debating with your horse and talking to the horse and explaining that what we're planning to go is so much better than what you're getting over here. We're going to go to a place where there's going to be much better food. No, that's not what you're going to do. Well, you, you don't argue. You just grab the reins and you pull the horse up. You yank its head up. And you continue going. And you, keep, you, know, you, you, you kick him on the side until you get the horse to continue trotting on the road. That's what we need to do. And as whenever during prayer, like, our, our thoughts go over here. Just pull the reins and continue. Just continue. Just don't. Just stay focused. You have to just divert your attention. This is like this, this flame. You push them. Say, in other words, the very notion that you feel, no, I don't want that. That's that you could do. I don't want it. That's like that taser. Out. I'm in. You're out. That's the tasing of it. And then you go lighter. Then you go, you continue in and out. Now we continue. So this is what we spoke to now was how the Shekhinah goes down and the purpose of the descent is to elevate sparks. But again, in this discourse, the main point over here is not so much the descent, but what happens after the descent, when the Malchus starts rising upwards, when she's going up, that she's burning with that fire. That's Midbar Sinai we're going to get to. That burning, that's what we discussed in the beginning. We're going to get to that. Now when the Shekhin and the Malchus rises from Bria, Yitzir, and Asiya, and it's going back up La Atzilus to be unified with her husband up there in Atzilus. This there's a verse in Shira Shirim, in Song of Songs, which says, Who is the one who is, who is rising from the desert? Ketim Reis Ashan like Like pillars of smoke. Piddish, what does that mean? It says, who is the one that's going up? Minha Midbar, from the Midbar. So he's now going to explain that the Shekhinah who descends into the world is called Midbar. Midbar means desert. How does Midbar, desert, have anything to do with the Shekhinah? He explains like this. The word Midbar is also the word Dibor. Dvar, Dibor. With a mem, it's midaber, like right. So what is so like this? When the shechina is not invested in this in the lowly worlds, when she's not enclosed in them, invested in them, or in the time of exile, then she's just called dibor, or she's called yadber, as we're going to see soon. Yadber, yadber means she's dominate. Yadber amim tachtenu, she's dominating over the nations, over the klipas. Midbar. Is a wilderness where she's well, 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 when she becomes a midbar means she becomes an open space that has no borders and no boundaries, and anybody can come there and claim her her space. One of the things about the wilderness is that it's ownerless, and because it's ownerless, all kinds of thieves and 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 uh, what you might call uh, fugitives can hide out in the desert. In the wilderness. It's a free space. So that's the concept that the Shekhinah during the time, she's an open wilderness. And the Klippas can, and we also know that the, that the, that the Midbar is a place full of snakes and scorpions and all kinds of poisonous stuff. It's all indicating the fact that the unholy is free to roam over there. But not only the freedom, they're supported by the desert. The desert itself supports them. That's what he's explaining. When she goes down into the klipa, Levarer, to go do this purification, across Midbar, she's called Midbar. We add a mem to the word Devar. Devar is Dibor, is, is, is the Shekhinah, which is the, the divine speech, 
Divine speech is what the energy that sustains the creation. But you add a mem to it, it becomes midbar. And it's a mem. Which kind of mem? It's not a closed mem. There's two types of mems in the olive base. It's an open mem. And the open mem, we know, represents the idea. It's an unlocked circuit. It's a non-secure circuit. So the shechina is then in a state where she's a non-secure circuit. And as a result of that, non-secure, uh, what do you call it? Um, not just circuit, the non-secure uh, server or whatever it is. And as a result of that, you know, bad guys can get in. And that's because as the Shechina becomes enclosed in the lower three worlds, with the intention as by getting in there she can extract. In any case, our soul, if our soul would remain in heaven and never engage in the animal soul, it wouldn't be able to extract and separate the good and the bad. Because the soul itself is utterly selfless. It's pure, it's holy, it's godly. It's our higher consciousness that is a piece of God from above. But when it comes down and it becomes almost one consciousness with our animal soul, and the animal soul is a mix of good and bad, only there can it, can it create, can it shine its light, its inner light, to show the more external consciousness how mixed it is with good and evil and separate the evil and extract the good, the potential that's in it, right? That's the process. Just like it is in our own small soul, it always is with the, with, with, with the greater Shekhinah. She descends and Dafka and precisely in the descent state, can this purification happen? So, but in that case, the chitzonim are able to get energy from her. Like it said, we say it happens to the soul. When God takes this beautiful, pure soul and puts it into the, it's for the benefit of the extraction and the clarification. But at the same time, what happens if the soul doesn't get the upper hand immediately? So what happens is the animal soul with its, all its, what do you call it, shiganigans or whatever they are, all its crazy and all its clippers attached to it, they will use the soul and gain energy from the soul and use it for bad stuff. Let me put it this way. An animal soul without a godly soul is much weaker. But when you have a godly soul in the animal soul, then that's why an interesting thing it explains, a very fascinating thing. The Jews, when they get corrupted, they can become far, far more corrupted than anybody else. There's a lot of energy there, a lot of energy. What do I mean by that? You see, the godly is infinite. Now, if you have a godly soul, a piece of God from above, and you and that gets st stuck in a negative place, then the amount of the vitality that's there is is almost boundless, and it supports and it's it's giving such deep energy to the clipper. That's why we know that throughout all the ages. And whenever there was various different religions, cults, and all kinds of stuff that were unholy, they always had some Jews mixed in it. There were always some Jews. And all, 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 all the various different, you know, corrupted, uh, whether it was, um, what's his name? Uh, Karl Marx and these uh, individuals. Everybody's Jewish. So many, so much. Why? Because of this deeper Shekhinah element that's within the Jew. And when it gets pulled into the unholy, the unholy wants it because that's where it has a link to the infinite. And that's what gives it real power. So that's the idea that the Shekhinah now becomes a source of life feeding the unholy. And that's the meaning of the Mem. The Mem is an open Mem. Dvar is God's speech. It's closed. When you add the open mem, it gives access into the dibur, into the speech, for divine vitality to go into the unholy. That's why what happens during the time of exile, at least externally and for the time being, temporarily, these very nations where the Jewish people went to clean and to elevate, and wherever the Shekhinah went to clean and to elevate, those nations became super powerful and became powerful to do many ways, various different types of corruptions and, the, and, and, and terrible things through that very investment that was invested. Since the way it works is, see, if the soul, he says, because the soul becomes completely invested and enclosed, what does that mean? If the soul would not completely invest itself in our animal consciousness, in our, in our but the soul would remain kind of a higher being above us, 
then um, they then the then the then the soul would never be able to participate in negativity because it would always be like we spoke earlier that there's a part of your soul that's always attached and that's and that's uncorruptible, but the the other part of the soul that does descend becomes completely invested, and because of that, it can drain its energy into bad stuff. Same as with the Shekhinah. The Shekhinah becomes completely, she goes down really into it. And certain external energies of her can get misguided and taken into the wrong things. Although it's very painful to her. Because she's conscious that she's going into the wrong places. Now, the time when the temple stood, the Shekhinah remained aloof. She remained above the outside world. She was residing in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem. So she was above the investment into the 70 ministering angels into the Klippas. Which wasn't the case, as he explains here, when the temple was standing. Then she was in a state where she dominated over the nations. They were subservient to her. She's in a state of control over them. So spiritually, the time when the temple stood, Spiritually, what did it mean in the higher worlds that the Shekhinah did not descend into the three lower worlds? She remained on her throne, so to speak, up there, and the the she influenced from above. She was always in the world of Atzilus. This is the idea to be This is reflected what the sages say, and in the days of King Solomon, the moon was in its fullest. The moon is that represents the Shekhinah. The fact that the moon has fluctuations, sometimes the moon is bright. When the moon is fully bright, it means she's receiving full light from her husband. She's fully illuminous. She's fully attached above, and then she has dominion, complete dominion. When the moon wanes and becomes less and less and less, means her light becomes weaker and weaker, means that also has one of the meanings of it is that the forces of unholiness are already, tr- are already dragging her down. She's enclosed in the klippa. She's being abused. She's being taken advantage of. Again, that too has... A- a, an unbelievable divine um, um, plan. It's 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 a scheme. It's a, a a an incredible war strategy to let her go down because in the end she'll take it all out. It's a purification, but for the time being, it's 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 horrific. It's that has to do with the diminishment of the moon. Now, if you take all of history, we find that Abraham is the first generation, and King Solomon is the fifteenth generation to Avram Avinu. So that's 15th generation, the Zohar says, during the time of King Solomon, the moon was in its fullest, and that's when the, the Jewish people were the superpower in the world. She was face-to-face with the infinite, with Hashem, with her husband, Batsilas. Again, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God's infinite, never descends. He's above it all. The Shekhinah is the source of creation. When he is fully shining his light to her, she's with him. She's unified with him up there. Then holiness is in a full state of God's light in this world is fully pronounced. The unholy is squirming, is terrified, is scared, is 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 hiding in its in its in the crevices. Fine, that happens then. But once the destruction starts, that's after King Solomon is passing away. And his children take over and it starts becoming the weakening of godliness in the world starts becoming weaker and weaker. The kingdom splits into two. Eventually, both kingdoms are destroyed by the, by the, by the Babylonians. The first, the second one, the, the second kingdom of the first kingdom by the, by whatever his name was, by, by um, uh, the one who took away the 10 tribes. And the whole system collapses. And the Shekhinah is no more the dominant force in the world. Godliness becomes... A a a uh, something that the unholy tramples on. They destroy the temple. Achlafiza, but then the question is, hold it. If the Shekhinah is not enclosing itself in the klipas, how were the elevation of sparks happening? We say in order to elevate sparks, you have to become enclosed. But the Shekhinah is not enclosing. The Shekhinah is remaining in Jerusalem. She's remaining above it all. She's remaining in Atzilus. How is the? We know that in the time of the temple. All of history, there's some extraction of sparks. So he's going to explain there is another form of extracting sparks without having to go into it and work it out from below. You can extract sparks by shining light from above 
and you attract the sparks of holiness. But that requires a very, very powerful illumination, a magnetic pull to pull the sparks out without having to go down into the place where the spark is and doing a surgery from within. To be able to extract the spark by shining light, by being completely above, is not easy. But it could be done. And it was done during the time of the temple. And during the time of the temple, there was so much holiness coming from Jerusalem that the people that were living far away across the world were drawn to King Solomon. And we know the queen of, the, of, of Sheba from, from, from Ethiopia was drawn to him. People from all over the world came, came to study, to learn, meaning all the potential sparks of holiness didn't need to be argued with, didn't need to be, you know, um, to, to, you know, that we go live amongst it and then extract and so on and so forth. It was all pulled with this magnetic pull. Because there was so much light in Jerusalem. There was so much truth that lies dissipated on their own. No one dared lie because the truth was so strongly pronounced. But when there's a lesser presence of holiness in the world, then holiness cannot elevate the world from a distance. The holiness must descend into the into the into the into the place where where the where the confusion is, where the distract, where the mix is, and from there debate it and argue it out and expose truth from the non-true, separate. And that's the descent of Israel and the Jewish people amongst the nations to purify and elevate the world and prepare it for Mashiach. That's the, that's the process. Now you're gonna wonder, okay, if that's the case, if you can do it from Jerusalem, why did God make that we shouldn't that should not have been sustained and that we should in the end have to go down and do the whole exile. If if you say there's no way to extract sparks only by being within it, I under, okay, then it justifies the exile. But if in the end you say there is a way to elevate the sparks and separate the good from the bad without going up, so it's, it doesn't say it over here, but it's explained elsewhere, that when you do it from within, it's more thorough. You could do it from a distance, but it's not as thorough. So ultimately, God wanted us to do a thorough job. So he orchestrated that we have to go to exile so that we should go into it and extract it from within and not do it from a distance. But here he's just saying the fact that during the time of the temple, there was an elevation of sparks, but it was a remote extraction. How was the, the, the 288 sparks? Again, when we say 288, it's a general number for the billions of sparks that are scattered all over. That have already fallen, and, and they need to be elevated at Libya, and they've fallen into the three lower worlds, Bri, Yitzir, and Asiya. They are then elevated through the Shekhinah, like we said earlier, that she goes to elevate those sparks. If so, since the Malchut did not descend then into the three lower worlds, how, how was the rectification, how was the purification happening? The idea is that the Malchut did not descend into even though at that time she didn't descend herself into Briyatsir and Asiyah, Makom Makom, Haim is Barid and Manitsutsim, the sparks were elevated, Machmas Hayichud, Zun Shahaya Batsilus, because of the, unific the unity of Zuchra Venukva, which means just by Hashem and the Shekhinah being in an intimacy, up in Atsilus, that allowed so much light to come into the Shekhinah, such illumination, and that powerful caused, caused an extract, caused a suction. Like you find that sparks get pulled towards a big fire or small flames. When you put them, you take a small candle and you put it next to a huge fire, the little flame will tilt. Usually flame goes upward, but if you put it next to it, it will tilt sideways. It will be pulled towards the larger fire. Since the unity was face to face and not silos, because there was so much illumination in the world of emanation. The sparks were being drawn automatically. And they were drawn and included into the Malchus, like a flame gets pulled into a big blaze. Because there's so much revelation. And only now, during the time of the descent. Now the, all of creation has fallen. There isn't such an intimacy between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and the Shekhin. So there's much less light flowing to the Shekhin. So now she doesn't have the power to extract sparks from a distance. Now she must go down. 
In other words, the Jewish influence in the world is not so powerful. We don't have such, we don't have the prophecy, we don't have such illumination. So just by being a beacon of light, it wouldn't extract the potential good that's in the rest of the world. So the Jewish people needed to go down into every country, into every society and get very mixed into the world. And over there, it's at a cost because many Jewish people, many, many add to the corruption don't don't fix things but quite on the contrary become a source for energy for that which is unholy and dark in the world that's every time you're getting involved in a battle there's always a give and take every time you're investing you can lose money or you can gain money it's it works two ways and god is playing a fair game so once the uh, it, it, some people will choose bad some people will be pulled in to the to the unholiness the davka at the bismana yerida and it's only now during the time of the ascension, she has to lay date Bibiyalavarada. She has to go down into the three lower worlds to purify them. Now we understand the difference between Yedaber and Midbar. Yedaber is when the Shekhinah is dominating. Midbar is when she's vulnerable. When she's unified with her source. Bematsila with her emanator, Ba'atsilus in Atsilus. And then the rectification or elevation of the sparks happen um, by themselves that w- effortlessly behind them. They become overwhelmed from the enormity of that revelation. They become on their own weakened. Similar to a chassid. Let me, let me give a practical example. When a chassid, we all, a chassid, a Jew was planning to try to serve God according to the ways of chassidus. So we have to deal with our own negative, evil inclination and dark stuff. And we're, it's life is a battle. Fine. And you use Hasidus. We use the study of this, these books and this incredible illumination to help us navigate. We pray and then we meditate and we try this whole process. And hopefully we get something. But then there was something called the Hasid went to the Rebbe. Hasid traveled to the Rebbe. The Rebbe is in 770. We go there. And, and, and when you see the Rebbe walk into the shul and the face is illuminating with such a godly glow, with such a godly light, suddenly at that moment you say, I'm never going to be the same. I'm not going to be the same. I'm not going back to my shtaha. You suddenly, at that moment, without any effort, the Rebbe's light is that automatically it w- picks the person up from their self-centeredness and puts them into a place of devotion to truth. That you go back home, you're in a higher plane for months with, and you what would have taken months and months of work of personal meditation to get to that clarity, you get by just looking at the face of the tzaddik and by seeing that energy because he picks you up because it's such power because in the tzaddik's soul, he's a super soul and in his soul shines the light of all the Jewish people. It's like, it's like a few million souls all in one soul. So that itself does the purification on its own. That's the difference of it. Or, or then there is a, having to go down. When she is compelled to go down into the lower worlds of Adidam, to go down to purify Nikras, Nikres, she's called Midaber. She's called Midabar, Mem, with the added Mem, the open Mem. The open Mem means that now um, she she is in a state where she could be taken advantage of. Now, this idea that there's two ways of how to elevate sparks will also be seen by a difference based on what it says in the Zohar. Fascinating idea. The difference between the permanent home of God, which was the Beis Amigdash, the temple in Jerusalem, and the tabernacle. We're learning about this week's parish. We're learning about carrying the tabernacle. The Mishkan was carried from place to place in the desert. So it's explained and 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 the and, and it says when they carried it, whenever they would travel, they would say that he been say Aaron when the tra- when the Aaron would travel, Vayomer Moshe Moshe would say Moshe would make an announcement. We say it every time we take out the Torah. Everybody knows he been say Aaron, right? But what is it really? It's a quote from the pasuk from next week's Torah portion. It says when the when the Aaron would travel, Vayomer Moshe Moshe would say, Kum Hashem, get up, God to your to your resting place. What was he saying? Why was he saying get up to? You? When they rested, Moshe would say, um, No, 
No, Kuma Hashem, get up, God, via Futsu Oyvecha, your enemy should be scattered. And later he would say, Kuma, Kuma Hashem, get up, Hashem. No, I'm sorry. Moshe would not say, Kuma Hashem, Lemnucha Secha. Moshe would say, Kuma Hashem, via Futsu Oyvecha. Get up, God, and your enemy should scatter. King David in, Tehil, in, in Tehillim said, Kuma, when he built the temple, he started, he didn't build it, but he prepared, he brought the ear in, he made all the plans. Kuma Hashem, get up Hashem, to your resting place. So how come over here it says, Kuma Hashem, get up God, your enemies scatter, which, is, which, is, which seems to be implying a massive war. Get up God and you're fighting with those enemies or get up God to your peacefulness. So the Zohar explains that's because when the Beis Amigdash was standing, when the temple was standing and we were in, in Jerusalem, in Yerushalayim, the godly presence was so strong. It was so the permanent. And the unification between Hashem and the Shekhinah was in its fullest brightness. So then it doesn't need any battle. There's no battle with the Klippa. Whatever was lying, whatever was deceptive was hiding. And, and the good potential that was around the world was being drawn like, with, like magnets. But the Mishkan, was a far lesser manifestation of godliness. It was godliness in this world was still in a state of immaturity. It wasn't yet fully developed. So the way it would deal with the unholy is it would have to go into their territory, similar to what we do during the time of exile, and slay the Klippas directly, go into the confrontation, go into war with them. And that's why that's an event. But when the, when the Aaron would travel, it would kill the snakes and scorpions, both physically and spiritually. And Moshe would announce, get up, God, fight the darkness. He's going to give soon an example of the difference between a king who's so powerful and he's, his renown is so great that his enemies are scared and they don't even dare to oppose him. Every, they just shut up. They're terrified. They're silenced from the distance. And that's one type. And then there's a king when he's not yet so powerful. So he... he, he in order for him to have his will, he has to actually go out into the enemy's territory and eradicate them. He can't do it from a distance just with his renown. He must actually send his troops in to go fight. So that's the difference between the Mishkan and the, and the Beis Amidosh, as he explained. The verse in, in, in Psalms where it says, God, get up to your resting. The Zohar explains over there. That's the difference between the Mishkan between the Mishkan, the tabernacle, Shoei Bemidbar, which was in the desert, Lebeisailamim, to the eternal edifice of God, which is the temple. Shenik Menucha, that's called resting. Lefisha Inyan, bidid on its because the type, because this idea of elevating sparks, Yashnoi Bebeis Bechinois, it can happen in two ways. One of them is Kamashik Pazavati Tenter, one of them is in the manner like we spoke earlier. Shulashom Chom, in which the Shekhinah goes down to wage war. A king that goes out in towards his enemy's territory, into the territory where his enemy is. And he's waging a war against him. Until he subdues him. This is the idea that Malchus, she's a warrior. She descends into the three lower worlds. To purify. She goes out into the place where the Klippas are, into the realms of creation. That's where there's a mixture of good and bad. Basha Usham, we're to the place where the, where the enemy is lachniyoy to subdue him. Or lachniyoy mishkan be midbar. And that's precisely why the mishkan was only where primarily in the, in the desert. Because the desert is a place full of the unholy. Shumakam yinik esachitzayna. That's the place where there is a place full of Chitzonim, full of the Klippas are there, full of the extraneous forces. And over there is where we took the Mishkan. To do what? To subdue them. And this is the way of war. But the, 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 the way of war. Now he tells an interesting war strategy. Sometimes during a war, a, 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 a part of an a, a, a army will take a hit intentionally. Um, and even though it will cost and it involves certain sacrifice, but you know the only way to beat the enemy is to allow yourself to be beaten. Well, for example, sometimes when the enemy is, 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 is um, bunkered in, when they're hiding in trenches, and, you, and because they're so hidden, you can't, you can't they're like, 
like um, they're embedded, especially if they hide. They, today's day is one of the things of terrorists. They, they, they hide among civilian civilian uh, population. So you try to, in Gaza, they always do that. They hide amongst, in schools. They're shooting from schools. You're going to go, and then the moment you shoot the school and you, you kill innocent people, the whole world screams, Israel, what are you doing? You're murdering. Yeah, but that's what they're doing. They're shooting from there and they're, and they're and on purposely. It's part of their strategy. So how do you get them out? So one of the strategies that used to be that sometimes is a strategy of war, a strategy of war, is that you... You send in a troop making believe that they by mistake got lost or they're not aware of what's going on. As a result of that, all the, all the enemies come climbing out like little worms, like little things. They come running out of their hiding place because they feel that they have a control. They can surround them. But once they've come in out, then you can send in the larger inventory and attack them and you have exposed them. You've extracted them from where they've been hiding. So spiritually, it works the same way that sometimes God allows for certain certain defeats sometimes we it seems like holiness is being defeated in this world and it's a temporary defeat but in the end there is a victory a much greater victory um we once gave a fascinating class about special needs children and about people that are born with physical or or mental illnesses and so on and so forth and we discussed that that has to do with certain injuries that happen to the Shekhinah. These souls come from the Shekhinah and they are attacked. The Shekhinah is attacked and these souls are injured in that battle and they are suffering tremendously. And the end when the victory finally happens for holiness and the whole world will celebrate, these people that suffered more than anybody else, are going to be first and foremost in that celebration because it has to do with the moon Gima Salavana the very very man it's a class that I've given a couple of years ago it's fascinating stuff so there he explains this idea primarily this concept that sometimes you allow yourself to take a hit and in the end you're you you that very very that itself is a ploy to win the battle as you lose the battle to win the war that's the idea Sometimes you allow the enemy huh? I'm good, yeah. What do you need? You can talk to me. What? That's beautiful, don't worry. It will add. And that sometimes they can prevail, do a little win in a certain small war. Give them a small victory. In order to Cause them to and cause a much greater victory in manner. Sometimes there's no way to win the battle. Sometimes the same thing happens when the Shechina goes down. She's called Midbar with an open man, which means she allows herself to be hacked. She actually temporarily gives them strength because by them getting strength, they become so empowered and they become so emboldened that because of their emboldenment, they go out there and do stupid things, and then they lose all their credibility. They, they're lost. You see, even in the world, when you, when you give someone, sometimes a guy who's not doing whatever, and you give them power, so then they go out. And once they're out, they're exposed for what they really are, and everybody sees, and then they, they're, they're rejected. I mean, this stuff is literally what's going on. It's going on now, such a global, that certain forces and certain have been given such power in this world right now, and they come out. And but the whole world, if you're looking a little bit deeper, you realize how full of corruption it is, and full of lies. And as a result of that, ultimately it will it will it will it's a very empowerment, it is its ultimate demise. In order to beat them on in, in a bigger war. And that itself is Lahitsi Bala Mapiam to take out what they have swallowed a long time ago to extract the sparks. Like it says, wealth he has swallowed is a verse, and then he has to vomit it, he has to spit, spit it out. And also the idea of there's a verse in Mishle in Proverbs, I think, or maybe it's in Kehelis. It says there is a time, I think it's in Kehelis, that the, that the man rules over man, but it's to its own, it's a, to its own um, demise. 
What that means is that the unholy man sometimes rules over the man of holiness, but it ultimately backfires and it's to its own destruction. That's part of this purification. That comes, all of this only happens when you're, when you're doing a purification in a war way. In other words, you're fighting. On the Mabchis Hashemis, but when you're doing when you're waging war from a distance, which means when your your power over your enemies is because you're so you have such power and such might, and they're so terrified, so they don't even they don't even step out. On the Mabchis Hashemis, but you're not doing a but Derech Mocham is not through a war. We find by kings in warfare down here by a human king in a Melech God of a great and mighty empire emperor. Everybody knows his power. Alexander the Great, after he, you know, conquered the world. Kichazaka, he, he knows that he's so powerful. And his wisdom is so great. He doesn't have to go out to fight anybody. Because no one dares defies him. And to subdue him. Since he, he stays in his own place and his greatness is so powerful. And therefore, automatically the clippers get subdued. Example we find by Shlomo, all of Hashem, which like it says in, in, in Kings, how the nations, people came from all across the world to hear him. And he didn't have, and by him there was no war. There's no opposition. King David fought wars. He didn't have to fight any wars. There is a form of elevation of sparks. It's not in the way of a war. When you draw down the infinite light down here, as it is in Atsilus, you illuminate truth in such a clear way, without having to debate anything, without having the sitra achra, the other side becomes disintegrates. Like a candle becoming nullified to the flame. You keep the, the major big blaze in its place, and all the small little flames, they all gravitate to it. All these flames are jumping towards the main big blaze. Because they're being drawn to it. They get sep- they get they lift it from their place. You don't have to go down to the place of the klipa to subdue them. That was the way in which this purification happened at the time of the temple. And even though Malchus didn't go down into this battle, the beer happened anyways. Because during the time of the temple, the Hakadish Baruch Hu called Zuchra, the male element, and look for the female, we're face to face, we're in a state of intimacy. And that means she, the, 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 the battery of the world, so to speak, the, the, the energy of the world, the soul of creation, was illuminated with infinite light. So she was shining with such brightness. So the divine truth was so dominant that that which was still in the world that can stand against because it's essentially evil was, was terrified to rear its head, was laying low. Um, there was an incredible uh, revelation of the Ainsof through this intimacy of, of the Zuchra Venukva in Atsilus. On its own, all the Klippas disintegrated from the power of the revelation. And the sparks became. Absorbed like a flame in a big blaze. That's why it's called resting. You don't need a war. He's quoting from the Arizal this concept. When the, when the temple was built, now he's asking a question. This is in the parentheses that Semach Tzedek is bringing again a bunch of sources and, 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 and things that seem to contradict some of it in the Ramaz in the beginning of Parshat Tzav, Rachel Yeredes Bebriya. That Rachel, which is the Shechina, goes down in Bria, which seems to imply that even Bein Be'zman Be'i Samigdosh, this is even in the time of the Temple, 
lost his tariff lebeis. So in the time of the temple, when the mizbeach was there, what does it mean? It goes down. It doesn't go down. There's an implication in Zohar also on that. Remember Pashas Yisroi. That seems to contradict. So he says, even if we say that it does, it did go down, even then, it was a very minor descent. Only to the holy of holies of the highest world of creation. It left the world of emanation, which is still purely divine, and went down one notch. But not in the same way, anywhere close to the way she descends to battle during the time of the destruction. When the temple is not standing. Okay. There which isn't the case after destruction of the temple. The Malchus went down immensely. And during the week, her light uh, became very, very diminished. So you can't. We find the sparks from a distance because she's not so bright anymore. Because her husband withdraw from her. That's the whole idea of the galut is when there's a separation between the, there is there is a, a lack of, um, of of family peace between shalom bias between Hashem and his wife. There is a there is a wedge between them. Hakadosh Baruch Hu goes up very high. The infinite is secluded in himself. He's not shining it into the source of creation, into the Shechina. So she has much less light, much less brightness, and her, her light is not so convincing anymore. Unless she gets up and close. But when she's at a distance, no. That's where she has to descend. We have to get go far more into, into the Klippas, Levara, to purify. Possession across atom midbar be psycho. That's why she's called midbar. But such a mislabesh is the clip as noiga because she descends into the clip of a to purify. Ava mem stuma, but that's an open mem. But a closed mem, when we said there's two types of mem, who penas bina alma de heroes. A closed mem is a closed circuit, a closed server where you can't, the clip is can't come. That's already much higher level of bina. That's called protected wine. We know wine is always to be careful with wine. That you know is to be is to always have a cork on it. It can't be open. But this wine has always been protected from the six days of creation. Okay. Now we go back to oh, so this is the time when the shechina is invested inward to sustain the creation to be involved. But then there is a time when she turns around and she starts ascending back towards her husband. And when she turns around to her husband to go up, she's burning with such desire and yearning precisely because of the negativity, precisely because she's in a dark place. And her desire to reunify is so intense that there's another reason why she's called desert. Because a desert is a parched, as we spoke in the beginning of the class, a desert, desolate, thirsty land. Her thirst is indescribable how strong she wants to be elevated. And as it translates to us, because our souls are so embedded in darkness and in the confusion, that when we have these moments of, of, of awakening and we want to go back, it's so powerful, it's so strong, or it should be so strong if we can awaken our soul to really go back to her true nature and she really wants to burn up for God. That's the next piece. Now it says she goes up like smoke. These are the 288 sparks that when she extracts them are going up. Allah's man, when the raising of feminine waters, like the like the smoke going up. Okay, we're going to leave it over here. Because further he's going to explain, and I plan on continuing either Saturday night, Matzah Shabbos, or uh, sometime on Sunday, I want to finish this. If it's going to be Sunday, it's going to be Sunday evening. In which I could, would like to finish this discourse, um, where he explains the Ol Moed, the Midbar Sinai, and the Ol Moed, um, two parts of prayer, first and the second. But this is really fascinating stuff. Everybody have a great Shabbos, and we're going to continue Bezrat Hashem.